Oh, hello, hello. How are you? Good to see you. The first person I am seeing is Lincolnite Yankee. I am here, and my goodness. There are times, there are times, folks, where I wished that I lived in Manhattan. Manhattan seems to be the happening place. I spend a lot of time in Midtown, not only when I'm working, but also when I'm doing political things and going and learning things. There are times that I wish I lived in Manhattan. Tonight is not one of those times. In case you are not aware, I'm here in Brooklyn and just over the river in Manhattan, on the island of Manhattan, the capital of capitalism, the home of Wall Street, the home of Times Square, the home of the United Nations headquarters. They are having massive power failures. They have evacuated the subway trains to get people that were trapped underground in subways. Furthermore, there were people that were stuck in elevators for hours. They evacuated, they, I kid you not, evacuated a Jennifer Lopez concert Wow, I am so happy to be here in Brooklyn, over the river. And I'm seeing all of my great, great friends, Kinky, Ramiro, Felicity, you're all here and we're having a great night. We're sitting here in Brooklyn where the electricity works, where I've got my great air conditioner on and I am in my Brooklyn apartment. And oh boy, I'm seeing Debs. Uh, Eugene Debs, E. Debs, I am seeing, I am seeing Vega, I, uh, from Tasmania, I am seeing all kinds of folks, and I'm glad you're here joining me. This is gonna be one of those late night lives where we have great fun. Someone wants me to talk about Biden, and it's already on my list. Joe Biden is already on my list of things to talk about. Wow, the inundation is here. So if you haven't already done it, now is the time to tweet this out. Cut and paste the link, tweet it out, say, oh my God, what did Caleb just say? He just said it, oh my God, oh my God. Put it on your Facebook, say, join this conversation. Caleb is going, it's late at night. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. I see Kronika talking about horrible, horrible infrastructure. Um, Wow, we have so much to discuss. Let's make this a bigger conversation. Let's bring everyone in. Alex Galizia says, haven't been on social media a while watching videos on the EFF. I don't know what the EFF is. Mainstream media won't report the blackout, says Ramiro. Well, they seem to be reporting it. However, as I pointed out earlier, you all remember when Venezuela had a power failure, how they blamed it all, they blamed it all, on socialism. Socialism caused the, the blackout in Venezuela. Meanwhile, there was a blackout and a lack of power in Puerto Rico for 11 months. No one blamed capitalism and no one, no one is blaming capitalism for what is happening tonight. Um, it just shows you the bias, right? And no one blamed capitalism for the fact that Russia and China didn't have electricity until socialism came along in much of the country. No one blames uh, blames capitalism for the fact that most of Egypt didn't have electricity until the Aswan Dam was built as a joint project between Abdel Nasser and the Soviet Union until the 1960s when the Khrushchev government and the Soviet Union and the Arab socialist government of, of Abdel Nasser in Egypt built the Aswan hydroelectrical power plant, the biggest hydro power plant in the Middle East. No one points out that capitalism had left Egypt in the dark. No one points out that capitalism had left Russia and China in the dark. No one points out that just this year, uh, or last year, uh, Puerto Rico was left in the dark for 11 months by capitalism. But there is one power outage in Venezuela, and that proves, that proves that socialism is an, a rotten system. You know, I mean, the, the China is going all over the world building hydroelectrical facilities. Russia, during the 1930s, had the biggest hydroelectrical power plant in the world, the Dnieper Dam in Ukraine. Oh, but give me a break. The bias, the bias is extreme. But I mean, I, let's talk about what's happening here tonight. So if you want to talk about weird things, weird, weird, weird things about this power failure uh, that is happening. Tonight, it's June 13th. It's about to be June 14th, but it is June 13th. So this is the anniversary of the New York City blackout of 1977. In 1977, almost all of New York City lost power for two days. It was a catastrophe. It was a disaster. Um, and it happened on June 13th, 
and 14th, 1977. Is that eerie? Is that eerie? Now, Cuomo was saying he hoped that the power would be restored by midnight. Uh, Cuomo is the governor of New York. Right now, they are saying it was a fire. It was a fire at a substation. And as a result, three other substations uh, either went offline or had damage or something happened. Right? It was July, July 13th, 1977 is when this happened back, the back, the last one. And now, um, sorry, I, I misspoke, June, it's late. Um, yes, um, and, and it was, it was July of 1977, July 13th, 1977, you had the big blackout in New York City. And, and now it's the anniversary. But right now they're saying it was a substation, a substation, um, caught on fire, and then three other substations went out. Uh, these are sub-power stations, um, and that's what caused it. And it's, it's a catastrophe. It really, really is. Roughly 62,000 people are without electricity. 62,000 people, right, are without electricity. Uh, they talked about people pouring out into the streets in big numbers. I mean, look at some of the video that's coming out of Manhattan now. Unbelievable. It's really unbelievable. I mean, and this is this is the capital of capitalism. This is this is the center of the Western economy. This is now it's not Wall Street area. That's Lower Manhattan. It's affected, but it's it's up around 42nd Street, 58th Street. That's Broadway Theater District, folks. Right? That's that's where it, what's affected the west side uh, of up of of Midtown Manhattan, around 42nd Street, up to 58th Street. Uh, wow, and that is some expensive real estate there too. The folks that are renting there and living in apartments are 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 not uh, are, are not not low income folks. I can tell you that much. Uh, that's that's a great uh, great place to live. Those folks are paying quite a bit of money to stay there. Um, you know, two three thousand dollars a month, uh, and there you go. Um, maybe three four thousand dollars a month. Maybe five thousand dollars a month. It's a, it's a rather expensive place to live. To live near Times Square. Yeah. Uh, wow. Now, from what I understand, um, they have evacuated Central Park. Uh, there were people that were in Central Park. The police moved into Central Park and said, for your own safety, you need to leave Central Park. They evacuated Central Park. Uh, they evacuated people from the subways. Uh, they have evacuated people from, uh, from, from different places. The, the movie theaters have been evacuating people and giving them vouchers to get their money back. I mean, this is, this is crazy. This is a big deal. Um, you know, Manhattan is so densely populated, so densely populated, right? If a similar area of space went out, uh, it w wouldn't be affecting this many people. But Manhattan is extremely densely populated. And right now, there is a big chunk of the island of Manhattan that has no electricity. That's big. That's a big deal, folks. And it points to a bigger problem that we have here in the United States, which is the problem of infrastructure, right? Power plants electricity. And I mean, we saw it. It's been a problem for a long time. During Hurricane Sandy, that was back in 2012. I don't know if folks remember, but it was also in Manhattan on the Lower East Side. The power plant exploded. Do folks remember this? The power plant on the Lower East Side of Manhattan exploded. It was like something from an Armageddon movie. Um, watch the video if you get a chance of the power plant in Lower Manhattan exploding exploding it was insane i mean you can you can watch you can watch what happened in 2012 that was during hurricane sandy that was that was that, that like shut the city down but this this is a power failure nothing seems to have exploded they're saying there was a fire and yeah wow um here we are um and yeah that's that's the situation. So there are times I wish I lived in Manhattan. Right now, I'm very happy to be a Brooklynite resident. I'm sitting here in my lovely Brooklyn apartment, and uh, I have electricity. The air conditioner is running, and I am I am happy to be here. Right? I'm happy to be here with you all, with my friends. Uh, you all are great. You really are, and we're having a great time here. I I don't know. Um, uh, you know, I I have a number of things to talk about here. I don't know um, how many of you saw that I had a conversation with George Galloway earlier. Um, it was actually a week a week ago. Um, I, I had a conversation with George Galloway, and then earlier today I had a conversation with Dr. Wilmer Leon. 
And Dr. Wilmer Leon is a great guy. I mean, he is a political science professor, um, and he is a radio host. He's on Sputnik Radio, but he's also on Sirius XM, the global satellite radio on Urban View, which is their uh, their African American uh, themed you know channel. Um, and he does a show uh, called Inside the Issues. And he had me as a guest on uh, on Inside the Issues today, and we talked for one hour. One hour I was on there with Dr. Wilmer Leon, and we talked the entire hour about my new book. And it was a, a great conversation, just a wide-ranging conversation. Uh, the, the audio of it will be up soon. Uh, it's not there yet, but it was just a great conversation I had. Dr. Wilmer Leon is great. I met him in the Islamic Republic of Iran, actually, when I attended a conference there, um, and he was there as a political scientist, as a well-known radio host, and and we have been friends ever since. He's had me on his show before uh, to talk about heroin and the heroin epidemic and opioids. He's had me on his show around a lot of different themes. He is a great guy. I've known him for a while friend of mine, you know, um, and I really like him. I really do. Um, and when he heard about the book City Builders and Vandals, he had me, you know, express him a copy of it, you know, drop it in the mail as fast as I could. And he had me on the show and we talked for one hour and we actually got a caller. Uh, we had one time for one call amid our conversation. Um, and, uh, and it was, it was great. Uh, the caller, you know, asked me about climate change, my view of climate change, and he praised me for talking about the Roman Empire and Carthage. This the caller was particularly inspired by Carthage and Carthage's fight with the Roman Empire, uh, the Peloponnesian Wars. So, um, you know, I think that was particularly interesting. It was a very productive conversation. Um, you know, and I was on with Galloway earlier, and we had a great conversation about Joe Biden of all things. Wow. So somebody wanted to ask about Joe Biden. I've got like a million other things to talk about, but I don't know if folks have seen. I said when I was on uh, with with Galloway, uh, with George Galloway last last Sunday, I said to him that a lot of people are saying that it looks like Joe Biden, despite being the front runner in the in all the polls, show that he's the front runner in the Democratic presidential primary for 2020. Despite that. It seems like he just doesn't really want the job. He doesn't want to be there. That's what I said. And what I said has become even more apparent as we go on. There are now rumors circulating that Joe Biden is on the verge of dropping out of the race. Multiple, you know, forces, Washington Times, different people are coming forward and saying that it's being whispered that Joe Biden is on the verge of dropping out of the race. And people say that there's some kind of health problem. Other people say he just doesn't want to be there. And who knows? Now, somebody's asking me, is it, you know, is Joe Biden a predator? And well, that's an interesting point because we've all seen those creepy, 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 creepy clips of him with little little girls and the way he hugs not adult women. You know, he hugged adult women inappropriately and smelled their hair in kind of a creepy way. But the clips of him with, with little girls are particularly disturbing. And there's not a small amount of them of him you know, touching these little girls, you know, in weird ways, in front of cameras, in front of all kinds of people. It's, yeah, it's pretty weird. And now we have Jeffrey Epstein, uh, who's been grabbed, right? Uh, he's, you know, facing new charges. Um, and people are raising questions about those 27 flights that Bill Clinton seems to have taken on Jeffrey Air, uh, Epstein's private airplane. Uh, there's talk about Jeffrey. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff in the press now about about pedophiles and how much people hate pedophiles and inappropriate stuff with children and Jeffrey Epstein. And now we got Joe Biden, who there's a bunch of video of him, you know, being pretty weird with little girls right out in the open on camera. Is that a factor, right? Is that the issue? Maybe the issue isn't his health. Maybe the issue isn't that he just really doesn't want the job. Maybe he saw this Epstein stuff and said, I'm out of here. But to be fair, these are just rumors, folks. I mean, we're seeing them in different places. There's rumors that Joe Biden is dropping out, but he hasn't come forward and dropped out. He hasn't come forward and said, you know what? I, I, Joe Biden, am dropping out of the race. He hasn't done it yet, right? This is just rumors, right? Now, there's a clip, I guess, of him giving a speech and coughing or something and, you know, but you never know what any of this means. You never really know. But at this point, you know, what I said when I was on with George Galloway, another great, um, amazing, amazing individual. I saw George Galloway give a talk in Cleveland years ago, and he brought the house down. And when I met Joe Biden in Russia, 
Uh, we were both there at, at the Valdi Discussion Club, and I went up to him, shook hands, told him how much I've admired him and, and watched his work from afar and just been blown away, saw him stand up to the U.S. Congress about the Iraq War. I told him, I saw you speak in Cleveland and you brought the house down. And he said, I know exactly what you were talking about. It was, it was great. It was really, really great. Uh, I mean, I, I really, George Galloway, a great guy. And when I was on with, with George Galloway, who I, I've looked up to for a long time, uh, when I was on with him, I was saying that it looked like Joe Biden didn't want the job. Um, and, and a lot of people have said that. And now we have even further, even further uh, confirmation that that may very well be the case. Right. Um, so, you know, people are asking me about Joe Biden. That's what I'm telling you about Joe Biden. Now, in terms of skeletons in his closet. Right. We know about Hunter Biden. Hunter Biden, Joe Biden's son, and his connections to uh, natural gas in Ukraine, Ukrainian coup, right? We know about that. I've done stories on that. Uh, you know, his ties to U.S. foreign policy. Uh, you know, a lot of people scream corruption there. He now brags that he got the prosecutor of Ukraine fired. It was the same prosecutor that happened to be investigating his son's company. Yeah, Joe Biden, corruption there. Um, the other thing is, you know, I mean, Joe Biden was running for president at one point and had to drop out because it came out that he had committed plagiarism in college, right? Um, and other people have pointed out, too, that Joe Biden was very much just like the Clintons, a lock em up guy, right? You know, we, we've seen that clip of Hillary Clinton talking about super predators and, you know, Bill Clinton, who posed with like a chain gang in Arkansas, who suspended his campaign and uh, running for president the first time to go back to Arkansas to preside over the execution of an African-American man. Bill Clinton, the, the, the 90s, 1990s, the Democratic Leadership Council, the DLC, which was this nonprofit foundation uh, that the Democrats started to kind of push uh, push a conservative thing. It was Bill Clinton's operation more than anything. It was very similar to New Labour and Tony Blair in the UK. It was almost paralleled it, except the Democrats never claimed to be socialists. It was Labour, Labour, you know, did, but it was it was a very parallel thing of taking the the Liberal Party to the right and. And, you know, the DLC Democrats, one of their big things was, you know, look, we may be Democrats, we may be from the Democratic Party, but we, we are not afraid to lock them up. We are not afraid to execute people. And Joe Biden was all over that. He was all about prosecuting people. He was all, all about the military industrial or the prison industrial complex, expanding the prison population, you know, war on drugs, lock them up, you name it. I mean, that was Joe Biden. That was Joe Biden. So at this point, you know, and we've seen Kamala Harris. Now, it seems like a lot of the forces that were backing Clinton uh, in 2016, a lot of the main you know, supporters of her getting the Democratic nomination in 2016 have thrown their money behind Kamala Harris. Wow. Uh, super chat there from Kinky. Deeply appreciated from, from the bottom of my heart. Um, you know, but, but it seems like Kamala Harris uh, is the one that a lot of these Clinton backers have thrown their, their money behind. Um, and Kamala Harris, just like Joe Biden, just like Joe Biden, um, right? I mean, was a, is a lock em up person. She was the prosecutor of California, for goodness sakes. Now, you know, Kamala Harris uh, has attempted to you know, clean up her record. She wrote this memoir trying to say that she had fought for low-income people and she'd stuck up for deeply impoverished people and she was tough and and people say the record doesn't match. We have the clip of Kamala Harris laughing about jailing parents because their kids are truant from school. We have the other clip of Kamala Harris making fun of protesters who want money for education and not prisons, right? And so Kamala Harris has a pretty ugly record there. Now, a little tidbit of information that I'm sure people watching this live will be interested in. Um, I bet y'all didn't know that Kamala Harris's father, Kamala Harris's father, Donald Harris, is a Marxist. Bet you didn't know that. Now, the two don't get along. I think they're estranged from each other, uh, not just politically. Uh, you know, I, I think that they don't speak from what I understand. But Donald Harris... The father of Kamala Harris is a professor. He's a Marxist economist. Bet you didn't know that. Look it up. Donald Harris, right? I bet that, that 
you know, he's a Marxist professor. He's written books about Marxist political economy um, and, and the problems of capitalism, capitalism creating unemployment and all that. He is a Marxist academic. Right, he's he's a, a a he's in that crowd that do the left forum and write you know academic critiques of capitalism. That's Donald Harris, and he's Jamaican. That is his ethnic heritage, and he has criticized his daughter. Um, and so there you go. Um, now her mother is from India, um, and uh, there were uh, you know uh, the the parents are not together, um, and uh, you know uh, and from what I understand, Donald Harris is not on friendly terms with his daughter. He's criticized her campaign in the press, which you want to talk about something that, that not supporting one's daughter. If one's daughter is running for president and you criticize them in the press, that's a pretty good sign that there's not a not a strong parent-child relationship going on there. But that's a weird fact about Kamala Harris. I bet you didn't know. Um, but hey, uh, what else is going on, folks? I mean, there's a lot going on in the world. Um, a lot going on in the world. Uh, so... The Iranian oil tanker that was seized by Gibraltar, right? The Rock of Gibraltar. This tiny little Gibraltar has seized a, a Iranian oil tanker. And the British seized this Iranian oil tanker. And they seized it on the grounds that Iran was bringing oil, bringing oil to Syria. Right? That's that's that was their argument. That that and thank you, faint signals from Vega. Glad you're on board. Um, thank you for that super chat. So, so Gibraltar, right near Spain, British controlled island, rock, uh, seized seized this Iran oil tanker on the grounds that Iran was selling oil to Syria. And, and the European Union is anti-Syrian government and doesn't want to permit anyone to trade uh, with, with, with Syria for whatever reason. So they're enforcing EU sanctions. They seized it. And now the British are saying to Iran, we'll give your ship back as long as it doesn't go to Syria. And Iran's foreign minister is saying that Iran has the right to sell oil to Syria. And I agree with that. Iran has the right to sell oil to Syria. What in the world? Okay, the Syrian Arab Republic, a country where Christians and Sunnis and Shias and Druze and all kinds of religious groups live in peace with a secular government. Syria, right, where they have labor unions in factories, in urban areas, in places like Damascus. Syria, where they have a legal communist party and actually two legal communist parties that hold seats in the government, Syria, some of the oldest Christian communities in the world, why, why would the Islamic Republic of Iran not be allowed to provide oil to the internationally recognized UN member state Syrian government? The government that has been fighting Al-Qaeda, the government that has been fighting against ISIS, the government that has faced an onslaught, the government that in response to the 2012 pro or the 2011 protests and the Arab Spring wrote an entirely new constitution. Why in the world? Yeah, I mean, this is absurd. The notion that it's somehow not permissible, it is simply not permissible for Iran, for Iran to sell oil to, to Syria. Unbelievable. Just completely unbelievable. Completely unbelievable. Um, I, it's really, really beyond me. It really is. I mean, it really must be said. It is really, really beyond me. Um, so, I, you know, I, and now we're in this situation where, yeah, I mean, unbelievable. Unbelievable. But, wow, this is, going, this is a great night. Thanks to Kinky once again for that very generous super chat. Oh, wow, thank you, S Sebastian, for your... Thing. The Cloakmakers Union sucks. Sebastian Misenech. Now, the Cloakmakers Union, that's that's what he's asking about. Um, you know, it's funny, right? And um, and I've brought this up before. Um, and I, I've sung it to you all before. But it, there's an important lesson here. It's not just a fun little limerick, right? And I, that's what Sebastian's asking about. Those of you who haven't, don't know about this yet, you'll know about it soon. So... Right. 
there's this whole trend, unfortunately, of communists and leftists and socialists calling other leftists and socialists they don't like fascists, right? And it's stupid, and it's unfortunate, and it's not correct. And it's one thing to say, you know what, this person is wrong. You know what, this person, I disagree with them. But when you say this person is a fascist, that's stupid. And one of the biggest mistakes of the Communist International was way back, 1928, the Communist International held its Sixth World Congress. And the Sixth World Congress, you know, they declared class against class, and they, they were going for revolution, and they were, it was, they were very fired up. You know, the Great Depression was on the verge of happening in the Western capitalist countries. But at the Sixth Congress, they made a mistake, and they admit it was a mistake. And they labeled the Social Democrats fascists. They said that the Socialist Party of the United States was a fascist party. They said that the British Labor Party was a fascist party, that if you were a leftist and not a communist, you were a fascist. It was a mistake. It was a mistake. It was just a big mistake. Social fascism. And Sebastian was asking me about, in the United States, in New York City, there was a labor union called the Cloak Makers Union. And it was people who made, you know, it was garment workers. And the cloak makers in the United States, right, their union was dominated by the Socialist Party of the United States. And Dave Dubinsky, uh, who was a socialist organizer, and, and the Communist Party didn't much care for him. So, to attack the Cloakmakers Union, the Communist Party USA had this silly song, which I will sing to you now. The Cloakmakers Union is a no-good union. It's a company union by the bosses. Those right-wing cloakmakers are just socialist fakers who play upon the workers' double crosses. The Hill quits Dubinsky's and the Thomas's are making the workers false promises. They preach socialism while they practice fascism to preserve capitalism for the boss. And that's suddenly embarrassing to the Communist Party years later. Uh, and the reason it became particularly embarrassing was because later the Communist Party entered kind of an alliance with the Socialist Party, right? And, and so... The reason that, that that tune or that song was preserved, it didn't just die when the Communist Party stopped singing it, is that Trotskyites would sing it back at them, kind of mocking them. Um, and it's all over YouTube. If you type into YouTube Cloakmakers Song, Cloakmakers Union, you'll find it. Um, and it, it, it's kind of a, you know, it's kind of a, a, a remnant of, of the lesson of, of, of socialist history, right? Is that the Communist Party was saying the Socialist Party were fascists. And so they, you know, they preach socialism, but they practice fascism to preserve capitalism for the bosses. It's a clever, witty limerick. Um, I was taught it years ago by a woman who had learned it back when the Communist Party was promoting it. She was a child, um, and she was in the Young Pioneers Club, and that was one of the, the songs that they taught her in the Young Pioneers Club. Um, you know, and she, this was a very old woman. She died, I think she was almost 90 at the time she died, um, but I knew her, she was in her early 80s, and um, went to her memorial in Cleveland. Just a great woman who had been a, a lifelong revolutionary activist, and, uh, but when she'd been a small child in Brooklyn, in the 1930s, in the early 1930s, she'd been born in 1928, so she was, you know, a small child, three, four, or five years old at the Young Pioneers Camps in, in Brooklyn and Camp Wochika for Worker Children's Camp in upstate New York. They taught her all kinds of, there used to be all kinds of these communist songs, communist, uh, you know, nursery rhymes. She, you know, she taught me one, two, three, young pioneers are we, we're fighting for the working class against the bourgeoisie. You know, I mean, just just little like there used to be a lot of that. There used to be what you would call a red culture in the United States, a red culture of just kind of, you know, you know, socialistic uh, people getting together and being socialists. Right. Um, that that was that happened. It, it, it was it was just part of America, part of the United States. And during the McCarthy period, it was kind of. Be, went away, and then on top of it, TV and all of that, a lot of it was like summer camps and choirs and stuff that people don't do anymore. Now they watch TV, right? I mean, there's a lot. Of, there used to be a lot of things. I mean, the Boy Scouts used to be a much bigger deal than it is now, right? The Girl Scouts used to be a much bigger deal, and they still exist, but they used to be before TV was invented, right? And that that's one thing. I remember I was talking 
one point to like some older relatives of mine. They said to me, you know, Caleb, before TV was invented, before TV was invented, a lot of these things were a big deal. You know, the Elks Club and the Freemasons and the Knights of Columbus for Roman Catholics and the Odd Fellows, right? That was a thing, you know, for fraternal organizations, they called them, uh, you know, uh, your lodge that you were a member of. That was a big deal. Why? Because back then there was no TV. So if you wanted to do something in your evening other than sit in your house and be bored, uh, if you lived in a small town or something like that, you couldn't turn the TV on, right? So you had to be part of a lodge. Plus there was no, um, you know, you know, up until the 1930s, there was no unemployment insurance, right? There was no disability. So say you got disabled and couldn't work. Well, if you were a member in good standing of the Elks or the Odd Fellows or the Knights of Columbus or whatever, they would take care of you. It was social insurance, social insurance. Um, and that was, that was a, a purpose those organizations served. But unfortunately, a lot of those organizations were very, very right wing. Um, you know, uh, you know, they, they really, they would require you to, you know, be anti-communist, require you to, you know, I mean, they, they, they were quite conservative groups, but it was a way people took care of each other during the, during those times past when no such thing existed. And actually they were so important that I, people don't realize this, the communist party USA started their own called the IWO, the International Workers' Order, the IWO. And it was like the, just like the, you know, the, you, you know, a Democrat might be a, a Catholic who's in the Knights of Columbus, a Republican might be a Freemason or an Elk, uh, you know, communists were IWO. They were in the International Workers' Order. And the Socialist Party, they had the Workmen's Circle, it was called, right? These things existed, right? The, 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 these kind of fraternal organizations were a big deal. It was how people entertained themselves before there was television and especially before there was computers and anything like that. It's kind of fascinating. And that that part of that, you know, was, was you know, summer camps for kids and, and you know, I mean, and, and communists were just as much part of it um, as ever. So, um, you know, hey, I'm having a great time, folks. Um, you know, I got a whole list of, of news items to talk about. Um, but I see people asking me about all kinds of stuff, about the Democratic Socialists of America, um, about all kinds of stuff I'm getting asked about. And hey, I'm great. You know, we're having a great time. But I know a lot of you have just joined us. So those of you who just joined us, be sure to tweet this out. Be sure to, to tweet this out, make this a bigger conversation. We've got so much to talk about. Oh, Kinky says, I remember in 1973, climbing up the stairs with a women hold up half the sky cafe off chestnut i went up i was scared to death that's how brainwashed i was wow well i'm i'm sorry but you know i mean back then it was everywhere right i mean the mccarthyism that's one of the weird things that that i think you know in a way our generation it, it's a good thing right i mean we hear ben shapiro we hear fox news the way they talk about socialism and communism but we don't really get it right for example right in this city new york city when you see a construction site along the highway, often, in order to mark the construction site, they will have a big red flag. And that's just a red flag. And they've got one guy in a hard hat will be holding it up to like direct traffic or something. It's a big red flag. During the Cold War, right, in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, they would never have had that. That flag would have been orange, the flag would have been green, but nobody would be walking around the streets of New York City with a big red flag. Why? Because if you did that, a bunch of people would see you and be like, what, are you a communist? Now, I'm kidding. And even in the 1960s, it was like this, right? Uh, the Revolutionary Communist party, which is a, a Maoist sect that, you know, in the 1970s uh, or 1980, actually, 1980, which is, I mean, it's the beginning of the 80s, they had this campaign they did called May Day 1980, and they would get five or six RCP members, and they would walk down the street of, of Cleveland or Chicago with their flag, and people would run out of bars and restaurants and beat them up violently, Right? And the people beating them up weren't all conservatives either, right? It was, it was just a thing in U.S. society during the Cold War. Socialist, communist, enemy. Socialist, communist, beat them up. Socialist, communist, you know, destroy them, right? I mean, that was part of 
the country. I mean, that was just the way people in the, this country were, were programmed. And it didn't matter if you were a Democrat, if you were a Republican, if you were not a left-wing activist, if you were not a, a, a socialist or a communist or somebody who went to peace rallies or something, you were not part of what they called the movement back then. If you weren't, you thought communists were the scum of the, scum of the earth. Um, and, and, you know, so it doesn't surprise me that, you know, that Kinky is saying, well, she went into a cafe and she saw women hold up half the sky and she was afraid. I guess that's kind of how, you know, that's how the USA was. And part of my generation is, you know, I mean, I, you know, I was born in 87 and, you know, I was in the 90s. People were saying communism failed, communism is not a thing anymore, but I didn't grow up with that. I mean, we talked about communism in school, it being bad, but it wasn't. I didn't grow up with the Red Menace culture, you know? And it's weird because a lot of people, I talk to people who grew up in like South Korea or Taiwan or people who grew up in like, uh, you know, like, you know, different countries where if you were in a U.S. aligned country, it was just, it was the same, it was worse in some of these more authoritarian countries in the developing world. You just had it pummeled into your head, pummeled into your head. Um, that, uh, that, that the commies, the, the reds are going to come kill you and brainwash you in a summer camp. Now, Kinky says, when I joined the IWW in Saratoga Springs, thanks to Eustaw Phillips, they intoned communism. No way would I would have joined. Wow. Yeah, I mean, yeah, there you go. I mean, it was just a big part of, of the United States for a long time. Um, it, it's very interesting. And the way people see things, you know, um, the way people see things, the way people perceive things, um... Now, someone's asking me about Mike Gravel. Um, and I know that Mike Gravel, I guess it is, you know, he's on the, the threshold at this point. That's what that's what I'm seeing posted multiple places, um, that, that he could get into the debates. And that what, I, what shocks me is that Gravel, his whole strategy is to get into the debates to give a left-wing platform, right? That a lot of Gravel supporters have no illusion that he's going to win. I, I know people who support, who support Bernie, Right, but our supporters of Gravel also, and are donating to Gravel because they want him to get enough money to get in the debates because they like his anti-war platform. Um, cool. I mean, that's interesting. I I think it's interesting. I remember Mike Gravel. You know, I I did a video about Mike Gravel. Um, but Mike Gravel is an interesting one, right? So Mike Gravel, you know, he was a U.S. senator from Alaska, um, and he read the Pentagon Papers into the congressional record. That was his big thing. It was like a filibuster. And there's video of him sweating as a young man in like 1970, you know, reading nervously the Pentagon Papers into the congressional record, making the Pentagon Papers public. Um, and I mean, you know, he's a left-wing guy, uh, anti-war, um, you know. And I remember when he ran in 2008, um, I was kind of excited about him, you know, in, in a way, back in 2008 during the Obama election, because he was fun to see on the stage. Um, and there were a couple classic moments. Um, I remember during one of the debates in 2008, um, Mike Gravel, they, they asked all the candidates on the stage, they said, now, uh, di is there any candidate who didn't come in a private jet? And Mike Gravel was the only one to raise his hand. And they said, Mike Gravel, how did you come? He said, I took a train. And a bus, and maybe someday one of these guys will give me a ride. I thought that was hilarious. He had a way of, he has a way of being. And he's a big supporter, as Star is pointing out, of the One Belt, One Road initiative. I think that's very cool. He has gone to Iran, the Islamic Republic of Iran. He appeared on Press TV live from their newsroom. He's a very interesting guy. And a lot of what he says about U.S. foreign policy is really valuable. And he represents that, that strata. I think it's very California. Of folks that, that coming out of the Vietnam War era, they're suspicious of the U.S. government, they're anti-war, uh, and they're into what you might, you know, label as quote-unquote conspiracy theories, but they're not Alex Jones. Alex Jones is right-wing. Alex Jones is, is, you know, I mean, he believes we need to restore the republic, 1776, he's pushing free market, libertarian stuff. These guys aren't like that. You know, you, you talk to them and it's women too. It's just a strata of folks that coming out of the 60s kind of held on to that. They don't trust the man, right? And they have a general left orientation, right? Uh, they believe people should get health care, uh, have health care given to them. Uh, they believe that, um, you know, that, that education should be provided. 
Um, I wouldn't call them like they're not the socialist and communist crowd either, right? They a lot of them are more into like UFOs. Uh, they'll talk about that. They'll talk about the Illuminati. They'll talk about a lot of the same kind of stuff that that you know that that Alex Jones will talk about. Except they don't take Alex Jones' ideological baggage. Instead, they hold on to kind of a vague social democratic hippie left wing message from the 1960s. It's kind of fascinating. So I see all kinds of people asking me about Posadism. Posadism, right? I saw that, that Arthur, Arthur Porter was asking me about that earlier. I don't know why you're asking me about Posadism, but if you want to talk about Posadism, have at it. Okay. Okay, so let's back up, folks. So Trotskyism, right? We know Leon Trotsky, right? 1928. Leon Trotsky is exiled from the Soviet Union. Stalin becomes the leader of the Soviet Union. Trotsky is in exile. Uh, he builds a movement of followers. Eventually, Trotsky organizes his followers. You know, the, the Communist International is the Third International. Trotsky says that Third International is no good. He forms, bum, 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 the Fourth International. But I don't know. I'm just kidding. I mean, it's, it's you know, there's an old cartoon from the Daily Worker, um... You know, you know, it has like a rich woman drinking champagne and she's talking, you know, she's got a friend sitting next to her and she says, he must be a revolutionary. He started his fourth international, right? It's like the idea and the common turn, the communist international is this huge group. The Soviet Union exists. Well, it's not radical enough. Trotsky's got to start the fourth international, um, you know, and so you have the fourth international uh, and that's Trotskyists around the world. And and then, you know, there's a law in the United States. Uh, it's called the Voris Act. OK, that you can't be part of an international communist organization. I bet you didn't know that. You cannot be part of a, an international communist organization. It's illegal. So hilariously, you'll see Trotskyist groups in their newspaper. It will actually say at the bottom, like, you know, their newspaper will be like newspaper of the 12th committee of the fourth international or newspaper of the international secretary. Of the, and then it'll have like at the bottom of the page, like, in compliance with the Voris Act, we are not technically part of the Fourth International. I mean, it's, it's, I don't know, man, it's, it's weird. But, uh, but regardless, right, so the Trotskyites start the Fourth International, right? You have different factions within the Fourth International. And, and the two biggest factions coming out of the Second World War, Trotsky dies, you know, killed, you know, at the dawn of the Second World War. Trotsky's dead, and, you know, uh, right before Trotsky dies, the people that are now the ISO, the International Socialist Organization, the followers of Max Schachtman, the people that, n that didn't defend the Soviet Union, they they're out of there, they fought with Trotsky. But after Trotsky died, among Trotskyites, you have two tendencies that emerge. Wow, we're getting into some really obscure, anti obscure lefty stuff here. So, after Trotsky dies, right, you know, after the end of the Second World War, you have two factions in the Fourth International. The first faction is led by Michel Pablo, who is the leader of Greek Trotskyism. And Michel Pablo says that, hey, the Cold War is forcing the Soviet Union to get better. The Soviet Union's becoming more in line with Trotsky's views because of the Cold War. Uh, you know, they're, they're going to become more revolutionary. And then, you know, get get up to 1956, Michel Pablo says, see, Khrushchev denounced Stalin. That's proof. See, it's happening. And so the Pabloists quit the Fourth International. They quit it. And they, they joined the existing communist parties. But you couldn't join them if you were a Trotskyist. So they like secretly joined the existing communist parties. They called it deep entryism. That's Pabloism, right? The Pabloists. However, the majority of the Fourth International largely taking leadership from the U.S. Trotskyists, like, uh, you know, like uh, the Socialist Workers' Party in the United States. They're followers of James Cannon, and they say the opposite of Michel Pablo. They say, no, 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 no. The Soviet Union, it's like a light switch, right? It's, it's deformed. It's, it would take a political revolution, some kind of massive uprising. Even though the Soviet Union's economic foundations are socialist, it's led by a parasitic bureaucracy. So therefore... No, 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 no. Khrushchev's not good. No, it's not getting better. The Soviet Union is, is no good. And that was the majority view within world Trotskyism, right? Now, among the Fourth International, a faction emerged that were followers of an individual by the name of Posada, and who was based in Argentina. And 
Posada argued, right, that guerrilla warfare, right, so most Trotskyists were all about, you know, joining unions and, and organizing factory workers. Posada argued that guerrilla warfare was the cutting edge. And so he and his followers were promoting guerrilla warfare. And it just so happened that the Cuban government at that point was also promoting guerrilla warfare. They formed the Tricontinental Congress up into the 60s and 70s. You had this group of Trotskyists that were promoting guerrilla warfare and eventually were out of the Fourth International because they were promoting guerrilla warfare. Among them is Posada. Now, what and they weren't the only ones. There was, there was all, there was like a faction in the USA called the Internationalists, and they were promoting guerrilla warfare. You had a lot of different Trotskyists that were saying that, hey, guerrilla warfare in the developing world—that's the way to go. Wow, we're getting into some, some obscurantia here. So, Posada, though, the Posadists are famous uh, for the fact that they believed in UFOs. And that's what they're famous for. And everyone likes to make a joke out of it. They're the UFO Trotskyites. And it's an international faction. It's a Trotskyite grouping. And apparently one of their beliefs was UFOs. They really, that was apparently one of their beliefs. Um, and they were of the belief, uh, from what I understand, and again, I'm only reading what people have said about them. They were, they were under the belief that UFOs proved that socialism existed on another planet. Because only socialism could produce space travel technology that was that efficient. And furthermore, uh, they, they believed something uh, related to um, nuclear war, right? That, that somehow nuclear war might be a good thing or something. Um, they believed that as well. That nuclear war was, uh, you, know, you know, somehow would like move the world closer to revolution and that the, the space socialists from outer space would come rescue people or something. Very, very strange beliefs. And that Fidel Castro in particular didn't like them and locked some of them up. They had people in Cuba and they did some provocative stuff in Cuba. Like they, like they, they attacked the, the embassies of some capitalist countries in the hopes that that would provoke nuclear war or something like that. And Castro really like locked them up, thought they were crazy extremists and dangerous. Um, it's a very, very, very strange, um, you know, a, a strange current. I don't know how many of them there even are at this point. I don't know how many of them there ever were. Apparently it was a Latin American thing. It was a Latin American Trotskyist current centered around Argentina, centered around this guy in Argentina, Posada. And they were, you know, UFO Trotskyites who believed nuclear war would be a good thing. Crazy stuff, but that was, that's what that is. And they've become kind of an internet joke. Uh, you know, um, that's basically what they've become. And they're, they're, you know, they're considered kind of a symbol of fringe Trotskyite politics, right? Um, you know, that's, that's basically what they're about. And it's humorous. I mean, and it's amusing. And, you know, I got to tell you, when I was in college, I was in awe of all of these socialist groups. I would go to these conferences. I got every single newspaper. I would subscribe to every single magazine I could. I was just enamored with all of these groups, right? And I knew the Mao, all the Maoist factions, and I knew, you know, I knew the, the you know, the, all the Trotskyite groups, and I, I was fascinated by them, and I bought their books, and, and I'm still, to some degree, fascinated by all of them. However, on some level, I've come to the realization that all of those groups, for the most part, don't mean anything. Let me repeat. All those groups, for the most part, do not mean anything. I'm serious. Most of those groups... You know, it's funny. I When I was a kid, I assumed that there was not a communist party in the United States because everybody in the United States, everybody uh, that I'd ever met in my little town told me communism was evil and it never worked. So when I got on the internet and Googled and found out there was a communist party, I was shocked. And then when I found out that there were, I think I counted at one point, you know, something like 60 different communist factions in the United States. It could be more than that, Right. Most of these groups don't have more than maybe 12 members. There's maybe five or six that have membership in the hundreds, okay? Um, you know, I think there are maybe less than 10 that have membership in the hundreds. But, but there's a million of these little tiny factions, and they're small, and, and almost all of them are centered around one person. And that, I mean, one person or one small group of people. And they're, they're kind of burnouts from the 1960s. Um, and what's very odd 
is even though all these groups are completely different, right? And I mean, you know, and there's like, you know, there's like, what is it? There's like the Spartacus League and the Workers International League and the Socialist Equality Party and the Socialist Workers Party and the International Socialist Organization and Socialist Action and Socialist Alternative and uh, Socialist Voice. Um, and uh, there used to be something called the Maoist Internationalist Movement. Um, there was, uh, uh, what else was there? There was the, um, oh, there was the Revolutionary Communist Party. Uh, there was the, um, uh, there was the United States Marxist-Leninist Organization. Uh, there's, uh, oh my god, there's a million of them. I mean, you could just go down the line, right? I remember, you know, someone's mentioning the SLP. Well, I remember when I used to go, when early, early on in my political experience in Cleveland, I would go to anti-war rallies, and there'd be two or three guys who were in the Socialist Labor Party of Daniel DeLeon, right? That's a party that was started in like 1890, okay? This is a party that predates the 20th century. Um, you know, I, I mean, there's, there's a million of these little tiny groups. Most of them, I would say, don't have more than 10 or 12 members. Some of them have maybe 20, 30 members, and they're all centered around one guy. I got to tell you, it's a weird thing. This, this memo has gone out among baby boomer leftists that you can only have one smart guy in a group. I don't know what it's about, but it's like if, if there's a group, if you have a socialist group and there's, one, there's a guy in it who can write books and give speeches, then that's good. But if, if two guys join the group who can write books and give speeches, oh no, that, that guy's got to form his own group because there can only be one leader. It's really ridiculous. Um, you know, In the 1930s, there was the Communist Party, there was the Socialist Party, and there was the 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 Trotskyites, and that was it. And there were uh, there were little factions, but they didn't. Uh, if you mattered, you were part of you were part of you you were either in the Communist Party USA, which was a massive organization, William Z. Foster, Earl Browder, you know the young Gus Hall. I mean, it was you know I mean you know Richard Wright, uh, Paul Robeson, uh, you know Claudia Jones. I mean, it was. The Communist Party USA allowed all kinds of people to be in those groups. Now, you know, I mean, the, the, there was no rule that, oh, if you're, if you're smart, you got to quit because only, only one guy can be... There wasn't that. The Socialist Party, the reason it wasn't part of the Communist Party was because they had a big, pretty big, big difference, namely the Soviet Union, which is the Socialist Party thought the Soviet Union was not socialist. It was an evil dictatorship. The Communist Party USA admired the Soviet Union and took leadership from the Soviet Union. The Trotskyites, then, they were a group of people that thought the Russian Revolution was good, but it had been distorted. Those were the three groups. And if you were part of the three groups, that was it, right? That, that other groups didn't really matter, right? There were three groups in the United States in the, in the, the left, and you were part of them. And in the Socialist Party, there were all kinds of different factions. In the Communist Party, factions technically weren't allowed, but there was all kinds of different people writing books and giving speeches and different ideas and, 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 and all of that. And the Trotskyites, you know, they, you know, they generally were considered, even though sometimes there were different factions like, uh, you know, like uh, the Mustyites and, and stuff like that. The, the Trotskyites were just a thing. You were with the Trotskyites or you weren't. That's how it was in the 1930s. In the 1960s, it's a completely different thing, right? You have the new communist movement of all these different people inspired by China who want to form a new communist party that's inspired by China. You have the Socialist Workers' Party and Trotsky. And, and all, the new left is full of just a million of these little tiny factions all centered around one guy. And, and it's weird, right? I mean, and I don't want to you know, get into too many specifics and get too much hate here, but it's one guy. It's one baby boomer male, and he is, you know, the group is full of people, and they'll tell you, oh, you know, uh, oh, our guy, he understands it like none other do. No one else understands it like our guy does. I mean, he he understands it. You know, uh, you know, Joe Bob is. I mean, he is he he's the only really he's the only guy who really understands socialism. Is 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 Joe Bob the leader of my party? Um, and they're all this, and it's weird, right? I mean, some of them take the personality cult a little extreme, but they all have the same thing, and it's weird. And the other thing is, Joe Bob is always white. He's always a white guy, almost always, right? There's a couple exceptions, but almost always, Joe Bob is a white guy. And I kid you not, and this is the sickest thing the members of Joe Bob's group are almost always white, 
But they sit there, and and I'm going to get flack for saying this, but they sit there. Almost all the followers of Joe Bob are white. Joe Bob is white. And almost all the followers of Joe Bob sit there and go, you know, Joe Bob understands black people like no one else. No one understands black people like Joe Bob. It's weird. It's really, really weird, you know. And they'll sit there and they, they, they sit there and they're just like, um, you know, you know, Joe Bob, Joe Bob is, is uh, you know, he's white, but he, you know, the black people all love Joe Bob. It's, it's weird, okay. It, it's just bizarre. And this is no disrespect to any baby boomer leftist. I'm critiquing baby boomer leftism because it's what was around when I got into this stuff. And, and it's, it's bizarre, okay? Um, and, and, you know, and they're all the same. And it's funny. And they all swear that they're the only true party. All the others are a bunch of phonies, right? And they all think their leader is just the most amazing, charismatic guy. And he's always white. And he truly understands black people, and that's part of what makes him so amazing. It's weird, okay? It's darn weird, right? And some of them have, have tried to control the personality cult a little bit, and some of them have taken the personality cult to scary, scary levels, and it's weird, and it's just a weird thing. I don't know if it's, you know, there's that whole cult thing, you know, in the 70s, you had the Moonies, right? Reverend Sun Young Moon, and, and, and you know, who knows what's going on there? It's a Freudian, you know, people want a parent figure, and, like, the baby boomers are rebelling against their parents, so they need, like, a new parental figure. I've heard people try to psychoanalyze it. You could also talk about the fact that world communism was in a crisis, right? They didn't have a communist international anymore, um, for example. Um, they didn't have the communist international, and there were people trying to form a new China party, but China never really was clear it wanted a new party. Um, you know, I, um, you know, I mean, you know, it, it's it's a strange, strange. It, coming out of that generation, you have all these, and they're still around. They're still around. One thing I gotta say is what we've seen, and I'm I, again, I'm I've seen this in the last five, six, maybe even ten years. I've seen another formation, and and that seems to be people my age or younger starting their own parties, and their parties are kind of on the internet. You know, um, it's, you know, I mean, you have certain groups that are started and there's many of them. I can't even name them all of people that are like my age and they start their own party. Um, and it, it's like an internet party and they kind of have Skype meetings. Um, and they, they get on there and they're, they're into Skype and they, they tend to do social media work and what they, they have meetings on Skype um, that tend to be about what some other internet party is doing or who they're fighting with in the web forum this week. And young people that are into communism, my age or younger, maybe slightly older, they form little political parties on the internet that exist to argue with other political parties on the internet. Um, now, you know, I mean, there you go. Uh, you know, it's organizational forms change. Right. Let's just be real. That that the way people do things is is different. People are asking me about specific parties. I don't do that. Okay. I rarely do that. I rarely, rarely do that. Okay. I don't do that. So just, you know, I'm not gonna sit here and and make a tirade against this group or that group, because they're not worth it. I, I mean, I'm sorry, but I'm just telling you, folks. You know, I admire the history of the Communist Party USA and and the amazing work it did. I admire the Black Panther Party. I even admire the Socialist Party and Eugene Debs. I admire the Wobblies. But if you want me to sit here and go through the 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 QWH and what the QWH or the XYZ or the uh, the Twelfth Committee of the Fourth International, I'm not going to do that because it's not worth my time. There are more people watching this live right now than are in those groups. Okay. I, I, I mean, I'm just telling you. And if I sit here and start going on, well, you know, the, the, the Revolutionary Communist Workers Revolutionary Labor Trotskyite League is, is they have a bad line on, I'm not going to do that. It's not worth my time. Um, it really isn't. It's just not, not something I'm going to do. I had a life-changing experience when I went to Ecuador in 2013. That was one of the most educational trips I ever went on. In 2013, I was a delegate representing a very small, one of these tiny little, you know, acronym, you know, letter parties. 
and they, I went to the world, uh, the the World Festival of Youth and Students, which is a global gathering. It's open to all groups that are opposed to imperialism and favor democracy and and stuff like that. But it tends to be communist and and socialist youth groups that go to it. Right? It's a global gathering. It happens every four years. It's sponsored by the UN. It's like a UN event, but it's you know it's communist basically. Started during the Cold War. So I went to the one they had in Quito, Ecuador in 2013. And I went to it, and it was a life-changing experience for me. Because, you know, you know, you know, there were a lot of communist parties there from Europe. There were three communist parties there from the USA. But most of the communists there were not from the USA and not from Europe. They were from African countries, uh, like, you know, Namibia, SWAPO, the Southwest African People's Organization, SWAPO. Uh, you know, from Af- uh, South Africa, the South African Communist Party, Zimbabwe, ZANU PF. Uh, they were from, you know, India, the Communist Party of India, Marxist, uh, the Socialist Unity Center of India. They were from, you know, I mean, you know, the North Korea sent a big delegation of the Kim Il Sung Youth Organization. Uh, you know, the Vietnam Ho Chi Minh Communist Youth Union. I mean, it was communist young people, communist youth organizations from all over the world. And I noticed, I noticed the MPLA from Angola, uh, you know, the Venezuelan Bolivarian Socialist Youth, uh, the, the, the communists of Brazil, all these communists from all over the world, right? And I noticed that when I talked to communists from the developing world, I was talking to a completely different brand of, of people. In the United States, if, you're, if you call yourself a socialist or a communist, you have two choices. On the one hand, uh, you can be a nut. I mean, you can be selling your Trotskyite newspaper and screaming and yelling and burning the American flag and waving Trotsky's picture and, and cursing people out and, and acting like a nut. And most of U.S. society will look at you and say, you're a nut and just kind of walk the other way. Or, or you can be a Democrat. Right? And that's, you know, how it is. There are certain groups, not going to name names, they're communist or socialist in name, but all they do is campaign for Democrats. And they read, maybe they read Marx once a year. Uh, maybe they have a nice convention where they hear a couple socialist speeches, but they're Democrats. They just act like Democrats. 20, you know, I mean, their, their day-to-day life is being a Democrat. Is they're in their local Democratic Party club. They campaign to defeat the Republicans in the name of stopping fascism. And they're just Democrats. So that's like the two choices you have in the United States if you want to be a socialist. On the one hand, you can be a nut or you can be a Democrat. And when I met communists from India and communists from Southern Africa and communists from from Asia, I was meeting a completely, a completely different breed of people. On the one hand, these people were smart, right? They knew Marx and Lenin like the back of their hand. They could have ideological conversations with you about theory and ideology, which you know, the folks in the Democrat groups don't do much of. But, but at the same time, they were not irrelevant. They were not irrelevant at all. These folks had, you know, they they represented organizations of tens of thousands of people, of millions of people in some cases, right? I mean, the Communist Party of India Marxist controls an entire province. Uh, You know, in Vietnam and and in North Korea, they are the government. Uh, you know, in, in Angola, they are the government, uh, you know, in, in, in South Africa, they're an essential part of the ruling coalition. So these folks, on the one hand, they're not, you know, they're not sellouts, right? They're not communist in name only. These people are, are revolutionaries. You talk to them, they understand Marxism. They are fighting to build a socialist society on the one hand. On the other hand, they're not nut jobs. They're not screaming. They, they represent a big faction of their society. And I thought, why can't leftists and communists in the USA be like that? Why do we have this false choice between, you know, you know, and it was a real educational moment for me. Why, why can't we be, why can't we be like that, right? Why can't we be smart about socialism? Why can't we operate in a rational way? And one thing I was repeatedly told, repeatedly told, by communists from Angola, by communists from Russia, by communists from China, by communists from Vietnam, but at this festival in 2013 is why aren't you patriotic? Right? I, I mean, they said, you need to find a way for Americans to be... Co- I mean, they were saying to me, right? I, I've been told so many times that if you invoke American patriotism, you are spitting on the people of the world. The people of the world, the communists of the world, were telling me 
you know, that, you know, you know, we found our own road to socialism. Bolivarianism is named for Simone Bolivar, who was not a communist, but he's a national figure, right? You know, uh, you know, Mao adjusted communism to fit the Chinese, you know, situation, right? And they're sitting there telling me, you need to develop an American form of socialism. You need to find the socialism within the American people. And these are people that actually accomplished something, right? These aren't people that are selling newspapers about Trotsky and screaming and yelling. These aren't people who've abandoned their, 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 you know, desire to build socialism. These are people that, you know, are doing it. These are serious political figures. How could I not take that seriously? How could I not take that seriously? You know, it was an educational moment for me. And I realized that, that, that communists in the developing world are serious. It's real there. And communists in the West, you know, things are changing very rapidly. The Bernie Sanders movement, like, yes, things are, are changing very rapidly. But for the most part, what communists do in the West, you know, what the Black Panthers did, that was real. What the Communist Party USA did in the 1930s, that was real. But what, you know, the various X, Y, Z, you know, uh, uh, you know the alphabet soup of, of uh, name your favorite party... What they're doing is not real. What they're doing is kind of uh, performance art. It's an intellectual discussion. You know, I will say, you know, I constantly, when I was, and I'm not a socialist organizer now. I mean, I'm, I'm just, I'm not. I'm a writer. I'm a journalist. I'm not a socialist activist. I'm not involved in the political process. I, I do my journalism. I do my writing. When I was a socialist activist, constantly... One of the constant mantras I heard, and, and it was funny because no matter what I did, I heard this, right? I mean, I, there were times I was in, in an office like constantly around the clock doing work and I, you know, I could build rallies, I could reserve permits, I could you know, sell newspapers every day, but I was constantly being told, endless, right? You know, you know, you know we actually do something, um, you know, Real comedy, don't read books. It's all about being an activist. You know, well, we actually do something. It was just this constant, right, that, that, that ideology and theory was not important. And what matters is what you do in the street. What matters is, you know, is, 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 is actually organizing stuff. It was this very, very like, you know, well, all the other groups are bad because we have rallies. And... I remember one day, you know, someone had told me that our group was, was the best because we actually do something, you know, whereas other groups talk. And, and that day, I remember, later in the day, we had a rally, you know. And this rally consisted of us going into a cage assembled by the New York City Police Department, setting up a sound system, and one by one taking turns talking at each other on the sound system. There were about 12 of us. And I remember turning to the person who said that all the other groups are bad because they just talk. And I remember saying to them, like, you know, it's funny. All these other groups just talk. What we do is we reserve a cage and get a permit, and then we just talk. <laughs> you, know, you know, it was, it was weird. I, you know, I kind of did a double take here. It's like, okay, these other groups are bad. They just talk, but we actually do something. But our definition of actually do something was, you know, getting in a cage, getting a permit, holding up a sign and talking. So it's like those other groups, they talk in their office, they talk on the internet, but we talk in a cage with a permit while we hold signs. So our talking is doing something, their talking is not. I, I, I mean, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm saying too much here, but, you know, I, it was just kind of when I, when I went and, I, and it was like, why, I, I remember thinking, why are, are leftists and communists in the USA not professional? Why do they not have a desire to win over the broad masses of people? And that's when I started to change how I sound. And at this point, I am not interested, okay? You know, I, on the one hand, right, I, I am interested, right? I don't want to offend anybody. And I'm sure I've offended about a million people in this live so far. I mean, there's probably every XYZ group, there's probably, if, if somebody's watching it from that group, I just spit on their entire organization and so sorry. Um, but... But, right, I, you know, I don't want to offend anybody on the one hand. But on the other hand, like, there's a list of rules that you get in left-wing circles. And no matter what you do, you cannot please these people. 
I am, I am dead serious. No matter what you do, it is a list of rules that you must follow to be a good little leftist. And no matter what you do, right? No matter what you do, you will not make these people happy. For example, right? I take and I have reiterated that Marxists do not advocate a violent revolution, right? That, that they prefer a peaceful transition to socialism. I've said that. That is the Marxist position. That was the position of, 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 of Stalin. I can quote it to you. That was the position of Lenin. That, that a peaceful transition is always preferable. You know, communists never favor revolution. Violent revolutions are forced on them by the bosses. They are acts of self-defense. I've said that many times over, that, and that going around advocating a violent revolution is not Marxist, that's ultra-leftism. I've said that about a million times. Every time I say that, I get a bunch of people going, what a revisionist and a sellout, I want violence, I want to tear things down. What is wrong with you? You know, I mean, you know, I am so sorry if I have offended you, I don't want a violent revolution. You know, I've had people tell me it's racist to not advocate a violent revolution. Well, I'm sorry. People of color tend to, you know, tend to, to have experienced violence and police brutality on a daily basis. Uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, uh, you know, I, I mean, no, not calling for left adventurous terrorism or left adventurous violence does not make me racist, okay? I, you know, um, I, you know, I mean, uh, you know, saying you don't want a violent revolution... It should be, it's called common sense, right? Normal human beings don't want a violent revolution. That doesn't mean you, you're necessarily saying it'll never happen, but, you know, you, you don't want it to happen because violent revolutions are horrendous, violent events in which all kinds of people die and they're horrendous, right? But there is a crowd of people that insist you're not allowed to say that. Not only do they disagree with you, but if you say that, you're... A, a racist, you're a phony communist, you're a fascist. So sorry, folks. I'm sorry I'm not advocating violent revolution, okay? But it's like, why in the world would anyone who is serious about politics be worried about keeping those folks happy, right? And there's a million examples of this, right? You're not allowed to say no, right? In the United States, I know it's chauvinistic, right? I know, right? You know, that America is North, South, and Central America. It is, right? That's true. But in the United States, the way common language works, people refer to the United States of America as America. They just do. Okay? They just do. Okay? I, I you know, I'm sorry. They do, right? And and I, I'm not going to correct somebody. I'm not going to virulently argue against somebody. If someone says, well, Caleb, I think you shouldn't use the word America. You should only say United States. I'll say, I respect your view. I'm not going to, I'm not going to scream and yell at them. I'm not going to say that they're, you know, how dare you say, no, they have a right to their opinion, but I'm going to keep saying America because that's what, that's just the way people talk over here. I wouldn't use a racial slur. I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't do anything that was particularly nasty, but I, you know, it's like, it, it becomes this whole subculture where there's a list of things you are and are not allowed to say. And, and, and it's this, it, 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 you, you start building a wall between yourself and the broad masses of people. And that's why communists in the USA are so nuts. That's why they're so separate. That's why they don't get anything done, right? Like, the, the object, you know, is to win over the broad masses of people to socialism. And there are a group of people that say, oh, no, if you were to ever make things more digestible by average people, if you were to ever do anything that might actually convince somebody, if you were ever to do anything that might win the broad masses of people over, then you've become the enemy. Like, the point is to build this little isolated community of people who think they're better than everybody else and are mad at society. I, you know... Why in the world, and I'm probably spending way too much way too much time talking about this, why in the world, like the Posadists, right? The people who think that we need a nuclear war because the UFOs are going to rescue us from, from, uh, from, from uh, you know, nuclear war and, and we're all going to have space communism or whatever. Why in the world would I care if those people don't like me? 
Are there more than 12 of those people in the world? Are there more than 12? There are more than two of those people in the United States. So why in the world should I sit here and like, oh, well, the Posadists think that I'm, I'm a fan. I, oh, wow. Oh, you know, I'm so sorry, Posadists. So sorry. Right. I, I mean, no, I, 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 you just, when you're trying to please those people, you at that point are saying, I've given up on trying to reach the broad masses of the American people. That's what you're saying. You know, if you start saying, well, I'm worried what the Posadists think, at that point, what you're saying is, um, you know, at that point, if you're, if you're saying that, 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 well, we need to make sure to bend over backwards that the Posadists don't, you know, I, and the thing is, the Posadists are never going to like you, right? The outer space UFO Trotskyite group is never going to like you because you're not them. They're the one true party, don't you remember? So no matter what you do, they're going to expose you some way. You know, I don't know. I I'll tell you a story. You know, the group I was in, you know, for a while, you know, they advocated the, the peaceful reunification of the Korean Peninsula, which is what the North Koreans have advocated. They've called for peaceful reunification of the Korean Peninsula. And there was a group, there was a group, a Trotskyite group, that said that was proof that we were sellouts and phonies. Why? Well, they want a violent, revolutionary reunification of the Korean Peninsula. I kid you not, right? That by advocating the peaceful reunification of the Korean Peninsula, that proved we were a bunch of uh, sellouts and phonies because only a violent, revolutionary war could reunify the Korean Peninsula. Why in the... I mean, it was like they'd exposed us. They had, they had found, you know, they said peaceful... And they would show this to other people, like they had the smoking gun on us. They advocate peaceful reunification of the Korean Peninsula, but we advocate violent class war reunification. It's like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? This, this rant, I don't know. I mean, who knows? Maybe this is entertaining to people. I mean, this is the kind of conversation I have with my friends on the bad day. But, you know, maybe this is entertaining to people. I got like a million other things to talk about. But we're sitting here talking about space Trotskyites and all kinds of stuff. Um, and we're ranting against ultra leftism and, and people being out of touch. Oh, but what else is on people's minds, right? Um, um, you know, hey, I like it. It's just being honest, says Vega. Gray aliens are intergalactic. This is entertaining. <laughs> really? It's entertaining? Uh, do you have Discord and what video games do you play? So asks me Winter Wacko Reborn. I don't have dis uh, Discord and I don't play video games. Um, so that answers your question. It's funny, um, you know, and I just could never get into video games. When I was at a, a, a small child, my parents, I, I wanted to play video games. And my parents said, no, 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 you can't play video games. And I think I just, you know, by the time I was in high school or whatever, I just, not a thing. I know a lot of people my age enjoy video games, but I just, I don't, I don't. I, I don't find any, I don't enjoy it. I like to watch movies, like to listen to music. Um, never been into video games. I just don't find it to be particularly... I just don't like it. I don't. Um, Ramiro Funes is asking me about David Harvey. I Hey, he, he did a Capital Class um, series that I, I listened to some of. I really I, I couldn't get fully into it, but it, I learned some from, from the classes I listened to. And I, I've seen some of the talks he's given about real estate spec, speculation and how that affects the housing markets, and I've learned a lot from that. Um, you know, I've met him before. Um, you know, he's come to places that I've been, and I've shook, shook hands with him. Um, you know, so yeah, I've met David Harvey. He seems like a very good guy and he's, he's an expert on capital, right? He's an expert on, on Marx's capital and the economics of it. He's based in New York, an academic. Um, but yeah, wow. Um, speaking of economics, I don't know if folks are aware, but Jim Rogers, uh, has announced, um, that, uh, that basically the economy is, is on the brink. He's saying in about a year, there's going to be a bear market. There's going to be a downturn in the economy. And he says it's going to be Trump's trade war and that Trump is going to blame it on China, on Russia, on Germany, and on France. And he says there's a tariff war approaching with France. This is Jim Rogers, the legendary investor based in Singapore. And he says an economic fallout is on its way. Um, and uh, already we're seeing a tariff plunge. You know, 
hey, we used to sell a lot of soybeans to China, not no more. We used to sell a lot of, you know, computer parts to China, not no more. Uh, all kinds of stuff we used to sell to China, it's, it's heading our economy. The tariff plunge is already hitting. And now Jim Rogers is warning us there's trouble ahead. And I think he's right. Uh, you know, Jim Rogers tends to, you know, be very insightful. I mean, when it comes to trade with North Korea, he knows what he's talking about. This is a guy who's made quite a bit of money on the stock market. He has, he has very much his ear to the ground when it comes to the global finance market. He's saying give it a year and there's going to be an economic downturn. And he's right. Why? Because we're not having real economic growth right now. We're having growth based on debt, right? Wages are stagnating. Uh, you know, we got young people stuck in, in low-wage service sector jobs. Um, and I'm just telling you folks, uh, you know, I, I think Jim Rogers is right because we're not having real economic growth, right? Right now, unless things have changed in the last 70 minutes or so, a big chunk of Manhattan doesn't have electricity, right? There are big sections of the United States where they are literally unpaving the roads, right? They are taking roads that used to be dirt roads and they're replacing them. They have this device called a reclaimer where they pull up the asphalt and they pulverize it. And where you used to have a paved road, you have a dirt road. Water's not being properly purified. Power plants across the country are not working. Power plants in New York City are not working, right? We, we have given up on, I mean, this, this free market idea. Everything that's public property in the United States is falling apart. Roads are crumbling. Bridges are crumbling. It, it's, it's a big problem that we have in the United States. And, you know, the, the base for a good economy is not there. There are big, big problems on the horizon. I'm just telling you, we're not experiencing real economic growth right now because people's lives aren't getting better. When real economic growth takes place, the life of average people gets better. When the stock market goes through the roof, but the life of average people doesn't get better, that only goes on for so long, and then you have a fallout, because that means a lot of products are being produced and all of that. We're already seeing a manufacturing lull. Look at, read the financial press. Already we are seeing a lull in manufacturing. It's already happening. There's already a manufacturing slowdown. It's already starting, right? And they've been saying it. I mean, read the financial press. They've been saying for months, yeah, this isn't going to last. Trump got in there, lowered taxes on rich people, legalized all kinds of drilling, did all kinds of stuff, rolled back a lot of Obama lending regulations, did a bunch of stuff that kind of artificially created a wave of spending. But that's, that's, that's all he did. He didn't address the underlying issue, which is the living standards of Americans have decreased. The spending power of Americans has gone down. Jobs are being eliminated by technology. You, that doesn't go away because you, you lower taxes on rich people and legalize drilling on public lands and out in the ocean, right? That just creates a little bit of a surge. It's pump priming, right? You turn on the faucet, you know, but if there's not a huge bunch of water there, the water doesn't just keep coming, right? Um, and that's, that is the problem. Um, um, so, folks... I know a lot of you have joined us in the last uh, last hour or so. If you haven't done it already, please tweet this out. Um, you know, please spread the word. Now, someone's mentioning an upcoming debate between Noam Chomsky and Andrew Yang. Really? Is that a rumor or is that for real? If that's actually going to happen, that sounds fascinating. Um, you know, I'd be very curious to see it. I think... What I particularly like about Andrew Yang, I do not endorse his universal basic income. I made a whole video about my critique of universal basic income. But one thing that I like about Yang is that he talks, Yang talks about the issue of um, automation and jobs. And he's talking about, you know, the deindustrialization of the United States, the economic problems that we're having. Um, and he's laying it all out there. He's talking about Amazon eliminating retail jobs. He's talking about, about self-driving cars and how that could very soon be eliminating the jobs of truck drive. I mean, he is talking about how we need to figure out what we're going to do with the economy with automation, right? What Marx wrote about in Capital and, and workers' competition with machines, you know, Andrew Yang seems to be the only one kind of beating that drum and raising that awareness. Um, and I think that's very good. Um, and he's advocating that, you know, that's this notion that the government should fix the economy. I also think that's very, very good. Um, I'm not ready to endorse UBI, and I don't endorse any candidate. You all know I'm neutral. I don't take sides in all of this. So, um, you know, there are things about Bernie Sanders I really don't approve of. Um, you know, I think his movement is pretty good, but I, I don't approve of a lot of his foreign policy views. 
you know, Tulsi Gabbard, there's a lot of things about her I really like, but there's a, there's a, quite a few positions she has that I don't agree with, um, you know, um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't take sides in the elections, I don't do that, I report on things, I try to be as neutral as I can when I'm reporting on things, just report the facts, um, but, you know, with that said, and I'm, I am throwing it out there, that, um, at the same time, you know, I, I will say that what I think is interesting about Yang is that he's raising, you know, the, the looming economic crisis and the underlying factor in that economic crisis, which is the elimination of jobs and the computer revolution and the crisis of overproduction being spurned by it. And that's what I think is interesting about Yang. Um, you know, so I think Yang's worth paying attention to and that, you know, he, because, you know, he, he's, he's like, you know, he's not like Bernie Sanders, I would say. He's, he's different. He's not like some of the other ones. He's interesting. Um, so I pay attention to Yang. I pay attention to Sanders. I pay attention to Tulsi Gabbard. I mean, I pay attention to Marion Williamson. I kind of make fun of her a little bit on Twitter, but, you know, I, I, I pay attention to her. Uh, you know, I mean, I'm following it very closely. I'm, I, I will say that, you know, there's this talk of Joe Biden dropping out of the race. The candidate that scares me the most is Kamala Harris. I'll, I'll just say that, right? Um, you know, she makes me nervous. Um, I feel like she would have the ability to effectively carry out a police state. Um, you know, uh, she very much scares me. Um, and the way that she just, you know, thoughtlessly, you know, destroyed the lives of people on a daily basis as a prosecutor. Look at some of those rulings that the California Supreme Court did where it was like she was tampering with evidence and really trying to destroy the lives of people she knew was innocent. It takes a very special person psychologically to engage in that kind of behavior. Right. When people are, are I mean, read about some of the stuff she did when she was prosecutor. Don't take my word for it. Read about the kind of stuff she did when she was a prosecutor. She is. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, you know, right. I, I You know, that's that's some special stuff going on there. And that's we should be very, very, very scared. We really, really should be. Um, you know, her father may agree with a lot of what I say about economics, but I think she's estranged from her father. Um But yeah, um, but yeah, folks, soon this, if you haven't heard it on Sirius XM already, um, you know, this conversation I had with Dr. Wilmer Leon today, amazing stuff. It'll be up later. Um, uh, one thing that I, I saw in the news, um, which I think is interesting is that, uh, that North Korea has, has just changed its constitution and made Kim Jong-un the head of state. They made him the head of state which I bet you thought he already was. He wasn't. Kim Jong-un was the supreme leader and he was the head of the military. But the head of state was the head of the Supreme People's Assembly. That you didn't know that. And that they made Kim Jong-un the head of state, they're assuming that that's so he can sign a treaty with Trump, that he can be the guy to sign a treaty with Trump. And people see that as a good sign, as moving ahead towards some kind of deal. They changed the constitution, enabling... Kim Jong-un to be the head of state. Um, but it's important to, to point out, right, a lot of people have said to me, very common, right, the fact that Kim Il-sung was the founder of North Korea, that after him, the next leader was Kim Jong-il, and now we have Kim Jong-un, that proves that this is just feudalism, this is just a hereditary monarchy. That's common in the United States, and it's not the truth. Why is it that the son of Kim Il-sung became the leader in 1994 when Kim Il-sung died. Why is it that the son of Kim Jong-il became the leader after Kim Jong-il died? In order to understand that, you have to understand the historical circumstances. You have to, right? You cannot, everything has a context. Okay, so let's back up. When Stalin died, what happened? When Stalin died, a couple years later, 1956, Khrushchev comes in, unloaded a tirade against Stalin. Besmirched, you know, Stalin was off. Just unloads a tirade against Stalin. Fast forward to the 1980s when Gorbachev comes in. What does the U.S. media say? Well, there are two factions in the Soviet Communist Party. There are the hardliners, and they're the good ones, like Gorbachev and manipulated, and they played people in the Soviet Communist Party against each other, right? Those old hardliners were a bunch of Stalinists, but Gorbachev, he was a good, democratic-minded, perestroika guy, right? Right? 
early 90s, what happens? All the socialist countries of Eastern Europe collapse, right? Soviet Union, you know, East Germany, uh, all of them, Czechoslovakia, Albania, all of them collapse. What is a key factor in all of those, you know, George Soros color revolutions that brought down socialism in Eastern Europe? Key factor, what is it? Playing two factions in the party against each other. On the one hand, oh, they, they label this faction the hardliners, right? They're the hardliners. They're the extremists. They label this other faction. They're the sensible ones. They're the moderates. They play them against each other. They stay. That's key, right? That's key. So then, 1994, Kim Il-sung, the founder of the Korean Workers' Party, he was, he was the George Washington of North Korea. I mean, this was the guy who'd been fighting the Japanese in the mountains he, his name, interesting, he wasn't born named Kim Il-sung. His name means Kim becomes the sun. It's like the Sundance Kid or, or Billy uh, uh, or, or Pretty Boy Floyd or something. He was an outlaw. He was Robin Hood. Kim Il-sung was Robin Hood. He was up in the mountains, in the mountainous part, you know, the north part of Korea, up there fighting the Japanese invaders, right? And, and fighting for his people. And they had folk songs about him, about the great Kim Il-sung and... He's loved, right? Uh, he was loved all over Korea. He was like a legend as, as, as fighting the, um, fighting the um, uh, you know, the Japanese in invaders. 1994, he died. So what had just happened, right? 1994, a couple years earlier, all these socialist countries in Eastern Europe had been overthrown. All of them, right? Had been toppled, invaded, all kinds of stuff. So, while that had happened, right, they had, you know, played these different factions in the party. So, Kim Il-sung, who's like the symbol, the symbol of, of Korea, he's like the George Washington of Korea, he's the guy who led the revolution, they make his son the new leader to make a statement. They're saying, look, we're not going to do what happened in the Soviet Union after Stalin died. We're not going to give that secret speech, number one. Number two, we're all together here. Kim Il-sung's ideas are still the ideas of the party. Look, with, with the guy we appointed, it's his son, right? His son. So we're, we're, it was to make a point. It was making a point. And that the Korean Workers' Party, it's a broad organization, all kinds of people. And it, it was, you know, it, it, it's not one guy is the dictator. It's... It's the Korean Workers' Party leading the country. It's the Korean Workers' Party leading the country, but the guy that they chose to be the symbolic leader was the son of the guy who led the revolution to make a point. And Kim Jong-un, again, continuing that point, right? When Kim Jong-un died, when Kim Jong-il died, they immediately, immediately in the U.S. press were like, oh boy, there's going to be fighting in the party and we're going to play this faction against the... Immediately, the USA jumped into how can we divide... And so, Kim Jong-un comes in there. Look, we're still doing the same thing. It's a statement. When a country is surrounded and under attack, which North Korea has been, in the early 1990s, millions of people in North Korea starved to death because of the, the petrodollar, right? Because their food system in the northern part, all the arable land is in the south. And they, they couldn't, they, their food system, they need oil in order to run those tractors and all of that. They couldn't get oil. And people starved to death. And there was a food crisis, okay? Um, and they are still technically at war with the United States. There's been no armistice, right? And so North Korea, a country that, that's like under the gun with, you know, with thousands of U.S. troops right on their border. I mean, they're under attack. They, they, they pull together. And by having Kim Jong-il come in there, by having Kim Jong-un come in there, they're making the point that they're, they're not surrendering, that nothing has changed, they're, they're committed to their, their anti-imperialist, they're committed to the founding principles of the revolution. That's what it's about. Like it or hate it, I'm not saying it's necessarily the right thing to do, I'm not Korean, not for me to say, that's why they do it. That's what it's about. It is not, it is not a monarchy. That's not the issue there. It is a political statement. They are sending a message to their enemies that Kim Il-sung is well alive. That's what it's about. That's what it's about. That is what it's about. Someone's saying, is that Juche? Well, no. Juche is a particular, it's called self-reliance. It's a particular interpretation of Marxism that they have in Korea. But yes, 
That's that's that is what the the secession, the generational secession in North Korea is about. It's a political statement, and that's what it is, and that that needs to be said, and, and that doesn't often get said, um, but it needs to be pointed out. Um, and I just said it, and where else are you going to get this, folks? Um, yeah, so. Folks, it's getting late. I've been on here for a while, but, you know, I'm not in a rush to get out of here. Um, you know, so, yeah, I see people are, like, arguing in the chat about stuff. I don't know what you're arguing about. I, I, I'm I, talking about North Korea here. I'm done talking about North Korea, but there you go. Um, you know, here's the thing I wanted to do. Um, I, you know, in the new book, there is an essay that I wrote in the new book. Um... And it's it's interesting because there are people who who don't really have never read this essay, um, and I, I think that they would be amused by it. So I'm going to read to you the second to last chapter from City Builders and Vandals. It's an essay I wrote called Odinist America. Odinist America. I'm going to read it to you. I am going to read you Odinist America. This is from City Builders and Vandals in Our Age by Caleb Maupin. I am reading to you an essay from this book called Odinist America. Across the southern and midwestern United States, it is common at high school sporting events to see the players join hands in prayer. This tradition has even become the subject of court cases as it violates the U.S. Constitution for any public school or government institution to promote religion. Regardless, in many football fields and basketball courts, you will see American high school athletes joining hands and led by their coach or instructor, bow their heads and ask for the blessing of Jesus Christ before they go out and engage in competition. Now, what purpose does this position, does, does this tradition serve? High school athletes and coaches will be very open and honest about this. The prayer is asking God's assistance in helping the, pr the players to fully concentrate, give their most full efforts, play to their best ability, and vanquish the opposing team. Yes, many coaches and principals have joined hands with football players and basketball players and muttered the name of Jesus Christ. But to those who understand the Christian religion and its history, something seems to be oddly misplaced about this tradition. Jesus Christ, let us recall, said that the last shall be first and the first shall be last. Christ's message and teachings have very little of anything advocating that one go out and struggle to the best of one's ability, put forth gigantic efforts in order to defeat a rival, rival group of players in order to win a competition. But yet, many Americans seem to have placed this worth, work ethic at the center of their worldview. Conservative American Christians have many misattributed bits of wisdom aligning such sentiments with the Christian Gospels. For example, many polls have shown that the majority of American Christians mistakenly believe that the often quoted phrase, God helps those who help themselves, written by Benjamin Franklin in 1736, can be found in the Christian Scriptures. However, if one looks into not simply the widespread interpretation of Christianity in the United States, but into the wider U.S. culture itself, one can see the unmistakable stamp of another deity whose ancestors predate Jesus and Christianity among the European ancestors of many Americans. Odin, or Wotan, the god of the Germanic tribes and Norse men, has a deep influence on U.S. culture. Thomas Carlyle, the Scottish intellectual whose text on heroes, hero worship, and the heroic in history, published in 1841, had a groundbreaking impact on European political thought, and he examined the influence of the pagan deity known as Odin. Carlyle described the ritual of dying Norse men slicing themselves open in the hopes that Odin would believe they had died in battle as only the war dead were allowed to spend the afterlife in the mystical hall of Valhalla. As one reads Carlyle's description of Odin 
As a god of grit, self-sacrifice, and hard work, one is forced to think of the American phrases like pull yourself up by your bootstraps. American culture is no doubt deeply influenced by Germany. The most stereotypical American foods, hamburgers, and hot dogs, frankfurters, both have Germanic origins. The most common American surname is Miller, often an anglicization of Muller. The religious beliefs of most evangelical Christians can be traced back to the Anabaptists, who were central in the 1848 German Revolution. The very concept of being born again is rooted in the arguments of the German radical Protestants in opposition to baptizing infants, arguing that until adolescence, a child was incapable of truly accepting Christianity. A great deal of American motor-mindedness and entrepreneurial culture is rooted in a kind of Odinist worldview. Americans will say mind over matter, arguing that anything is possible. If you just put forward enough effort, Americans will blame those who are economically destitute for their own situation, arguing that if only they had put forward substantial effort, they would not be impoverished. Americans routinely attribute the geopolitical position of the United States to a belief that the country is more hard-working than other nations. A great deal is written about the Protestant work ethic and the influence of theologian John Calvin on American history and thinking. But the influence of, Germanic, of the Germanic pagan ethos is rarely explored. However, the American consumerist celebration of Christmas, complete with decorated pine trees, long hours worked by retail workers, running up of credit card debt, and a mythical figure with a long white beard who appears once a year for Yuletide, reveals that Odin is quite well alive, though perhaps deeply buried in the American psyche. Neoliberal economics, promoted by globalist financial institutions, has latched on to this spiritual current among the American people. Milton Friedman was a child of immigrants from Hungary. Ayn Rand was born in Russia. Ludwig von Mises and Friedrich von Hayek were anything but American, yet the economic theories they pushed were very easily swallowed by the American people. The American culture of hard work pays off and a, man ha a man's house is his castle became very, a very welcome host for free market economic theories and parasitical international banking institutions and corporations. The Odinist values of Americans have been channeled to argue for policies of deregulation and full integration of the country into the open international system. As the result of decades of privatizations and deregulations and globalization treaties, the USA is in an overall economic decline. As the USA, across the USA, roads are being unpaved because municipalities cannot afford to maintain them. Water is not being properly purified um, uh, uh, because, I'm sorry, Water is not being properly purified. The U.S. Department of Agriculture reports that a number of households across the country are food insecure with basic nutrition access at risk. The industrial middle class has been eroded by both technological advances eliminating labor and a global race to the bottom as corporations scour the globe searching for the lowest paid workers. The vast natural resources of the country produce huge amounts of wealth for Wall Street oil and fracking companies, while the people who inhabit the vast territories of the country where oil and gas is extracted become poorer and poorer over the years. While such circumstances in other nations might result in some kind of socialist or nationalist upsurge, blaming the corporations and banks that have swept away prosperity, Americans have largely internalized a kind of Odinist interpretation of their hardships. They watch TV programs talking about rags to riches and Horatio Alger-like stories in which people have become rich by working hard and sacrificing. Americans suffer in silence, believing that, they're, that they themselves are the ones to blame for their suffering, and only if they work harder and sacrifice more can they become better off. Efforts to understand the economic situation in an overall or collective sense are largely absent among the population. Americans will happily consume books about how to personally save money, uh, to think like a wealthy person, books on nature of the economy itself and the economic conditions of the country do not sell very well. As their incomes decrease and their lives become less and less stable, Americans increasingly turn to opioids in the hopes of finding some level of solace. The diseases of despair, such as narcotics, alcoholism, and suicide are claiming the lives of an increasing number of Americans. 
neoliberalism, which largely guts and undermines the U.S. economy, has hijacked the work hard to get ahead and go out and make something of yourself sentiments that were once quite a boon to U.S. society overall. However, among Americans, young, among younger people in the United States, figures like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Bernie Sanders are certainly popular. These figures have openly called for expanding the U.S. welfare state, guaranteeing education and health care to the population, and imposing a heavier tax burden on the rich. Millennial Americans, who face a much harder economic situation than their parents, are much more sympathetic to social democratic rhetoric. However, a right-wing current remains very widespread in critiquing democratic socialism as being un-American. Those who follow Sanders or Ocasio-Cortez are labeled as lazy, spoiled, pathetic. They are portrayed as wanting government handouts and begging the government to give them stuff for free. The term snowflake, referring to a kind of cultivated oversensitivity among the younger generation by right-wing critics, uh, has become popular. Young people are attract who are attracted to socialism are presented as being simply weaklings who do not understand the Odinist values of grit and sacrifice that once made America great. Some of these criticisms are valid. The majority occurrence of the contemporary left, largely controlled and crafted by academia, are very much guided by postmodernism, identity politics, and ultra-sensitivity. The campus-based activist groups tend to begin meetings with each attendee stating their preferred gender pronoun and a rhetoric that creates a kind of self-care therapeutic atmosphere in which victimhood is aspired to as an ideal state of being. The right accurately critiques the prevailing left as unleashing sentiments largely rooted in jealousy and resentment and a desire to tear down those who, quote, have it too good and benefit from white privilege or cisgender hierarchy. However, however, the overall history of leftism in the United States and the world tells a different story. The history of socialism in America is not limited to postmodern whining about its unfair and calls for an expanded welfare state along with a ban on mansplaining. The socialist current in U.S. history, going back to the 1800s, includes figures like Daniel DeLeon, Eugene Debs, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, William Z. Foster, Henry Winston, Claudia Jones and Huey Newton, among others. These figures, despite being leftist and anti-capitalist, espoused almost the same kind of American and Odinist values of grit, self-sacrifice, and struggle. Their rhetoric included a burning anger, as well as a call for selfless courage and relentless effort to change the world. Furthermore, their vision of socialism was not an expanded welfare state, but rather a centrally planned economy in which the people of the United States were mobilized to reconstruct the entire country along egalitarian lines. When one reads the works of American Marxists from the 1930s and sees how they marveled at Stalin's five-year plans, one can see a clear identification of an Americanism within it. Anna Louise Strong, the American journalist who became a leading pro-Soviet voice, argued in her memoir, I Change Worlds, that the Soviet construction efforts were the greatest example of the American mindset being applied. During the Second World War, the U.S. Marine Corps popularized the phrase Gung Ho, a Chinese slogan utilized by Mao Zedong on the eighth, in the 8th Route Army, and it means all together and joint efforts. A Hollywood movie called Gung Ho was produced and circulated, and to this day, American slang refers to having great enthusiasm as being very gung-ho. This, again, shows Americans seeing their Odinist values enacted by communist rather than capitalist and individualist forces. The Odinist spirit of American culture has so far only been utilized by neoliberalism. Free market advocates have effectively presented themselves as the defenders of the American way of hard work and entrepreneurialism. However, as the socialist movement expands and anti-capitalist ideas become more and more popular, socialism will most likely need to adjust and find a way to adapt itself with the motor-mindedness and will-to-power sentiments that are central in the minds of so many working-class people across the USA. Americans believe in hard work, sacrifice, grit, valor, and struggle. 
Such sentiments are present all throughout the world, and Americans have more than a small streak of these values, but they are hardly unique to our shores. However, the efforts glorified by such values are most effective when they are combined, when nations are no longer held back by the irrationality of greed and the anarchy of production, whole peoples and communities are capable of being mobilized to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and achieve results that are highly impressive. Collectivism is not inherently a rewarding of weakness, and grit and struggle are not limited to liberal individualism. When groups of human beings pull together, their ability to achieve tremendous results is much greater. If the Americanist sentiments could be combined with socialist economics, the results would be astronomical. And that is an essay published in my book, City Builders and Vandals in Our Age, where I talk about how the right wing, this Odinist sentiment, go out and struggle and work hard and sacrifice, that Odinist sentiment has been hijacked by the right wing. However, it was the same kind of emotions that Stalin unleashed during his five-year plans. That there is a socialistic side to those sentiments, and that we shouldn't we shouldn't hand over that desire to go out and work hard and achieve something that shouldn't belong to the right wing, right? Entrepreneurialism, the capitalists shouldn't be able to claim that as their own. That's that's all I was saying. Some people took offense to that essay. They thought I was being over the top or something like that. That's all I was saying, and I quote, I, I reference Huey Newton, and I talk about, you know, anti-racist struggles. I think that, that we need to remember that the American people, and especially immigrants too, right? People say, well, you're saying the American people, you mean white people. No, I mean immigrants. Those people that have jumped over fences to get here from South America, do you think those folks are weaklings? Do you think those folks just, just want to sit back and get the government? Oh, no, those are hardworking people. Right? The, the, immigrant, the immigrant communities that have come here, that is a big part of the United States. Right? It's a big part of U.S. history is people, people who want to get places, people who want to work hard and struggle and get things done. And the right wing has said that socialists don't believe in that. And they're wrong. Socialists do believe in grit and struggle and sacrifice, but they don't believe, they don't believe that you should gain at the expense of somebody else. That's the difference. There's nothing wrong with getting rich, but nobody should ever get rich by making someone else poor. That's the point of socialism. And yes, when socialism comes to America, we are gonna work hard. We are gonna go out and we are gonna build new bridges, build new high-speed trains, invent new computer systems. We are gonna work hard and struggle and when we do it, the whole country is gonna become wealthier, right? Socialism is about going out and working hard and building and struggling, but doing it in a way that benefits all of society. Not tearing somebody else down, not plundering, not exploiting people, building up so that a rising tide can lift all boats. That's what socialism is about. That's what socialism is about. Socialism is when whole countries pull themselves up by their bootstraps and sacrifice and struggle to build a better life for their kids and for their community. Socialism isn't about hating America. Socialism is about hating your country or your community. Socialism is about loving your country and your community so much that you say that greed can no longer be tolerated. Racism can no longer be tolerated. Uh, an unfolding low-wage police state can no longer be tolerated. It is about, is about being so dedicated to building a better life for your kids, for your community, for your country. It is about trying to make a better world and being willing to go out and struggle and sacrifice to do it. Now, Kinky says, the more you offend Caleb, the more you're getting through, own it. Well, thank you, Kinky. It needs to be said, right, that socialism, socialism is not about, it's not for weaklings. I would say that, that the right wing that sit back and say, ah, screw everybody, uh, you know, I don't want to pay taxes, I, uh, I, don't want to sh I don't care if the country falls apart as long as I'm being taken care of. That is a weakling attitude. But socialists are people that take responsibility. They take responsibility for the future of their community, for the future of their country. There's nothing more adult, 
There's nothing more, more mature. There's nothing more responsible than being a socialist. The way socialists are portrayed by the right wing, they have got it completely wrong. They are the snowflakes. They are the snowflakes of ever. It's socialists who really, it is the socialism that built Russia and China into global superpowers. It's the socialism that made Cuba what it is with their medical volunteers all over the world. It's, it's the socialism that has made you know, uh, Bolivia the country with the highest GDP growth rate in, in all of South America. It is, it is hard work, struggle, and sacrifice for the benefit of all. It is responsibility. It, it, is, it is getting rich, but getting rich in a way that doesn't make somebody else poor, right? And that needs to be said. And we should not, we should not hand over Odinism, the Odinist feelings. We should not hand it over to Ben Shapiro. We should not hand it over to Jordan Peterson. We shouldn't hand it over to Tucker Carlson. They don't own that mentality, right? They do not own that mentality, right? And, and capitalism, American entrepreneurial sentiments don't belong to the capitalists. They don't, they really don't. And especially socialism for the 21st century involves business owners and entrepreneurialism. I've talked about Nicaragua. You know, today, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just going off. Today, you know, we know about these immigrants. We know Trump has done his ICE raids, and, and we know the facilities. Now even Mike Pence is coming out and talking about how, how horrendous these facilities are. Where are these folks coming from? Guatemala, Honduras, Mexico, countries that have been destroyed by capitalism. So while people are, while things are so bad in these countries, while a lot of these immigrants that are coming over the border don't speak Spanish, they speak indigenous languages because they, they, they don't have universal literacy in these countries, right? That's, that's what capitalism has done. For all the thousands of years that Guatemala and Honduras and Mexico have been part of the global capitalist system, they haven't even achieved universal literacy yet, right? Whole sections of the country without running water, without electricity. I mean, this is, you know, meanwhile in Nicaragua, Nicaragua, where the socialist government is in power, what are they doing right now? Operation Smile. I'm sorry, I don't normally get emotional, but part of me just gets emotional about this. Operation Smile. This is what the, the Sandinistas are doing. They are providing people, people who've never had, never had, you know, dental care. And all over the country, they are sending dentists to give people dental care. And they are calling it Operation Smile. And that's what socialism is doing in Nicaragua. All these parts of, of, of Latin America, of Central America, that have never been, in, you know, have been kept in, in chronic poverty. You know, illiteracy. No electricity, no running water. People living in, in shacks, right? People are fleeing capitalism. But in Nicaragua, right now, they're going out of their way to make sure that every person in the country gets free dental care. And they have Operation Smile, and you can look at this. They have dentists that are going from village to village, giving low-income people dental care for the first time in their lives. They've never had dental care, right? Their whole lives, I mean, think about it. You know, think about poverty. You know, people make jokes about Appalachia, right? And they talk about, oh, you know, the hillbillies that have no teeth. Think about that, though, right? You know, the ability that all these people all throughout Nicaragua, because of socialism, are now going to have the ability to see a dentist, right? But, you know, but these people would tell you that socialism failed. I mean, I mean, I, you know, I mean, it's unbelievable. Operation Smile, read about that. That Compare socialist Nicaragua and what they are doing for the, for the people there, where they've already wiped out illiteracy. They wiped out illiteracy in the 1980s, right? You know, uh, you know, despite the fact there was a civil war going on and Ronald Reagan was sending terrorists down there to tear the place up and sell drugs and, and bomb harbors, right? You know, they, they wiped out illiteracy. They got healthcare clinics with Cuban doctors. And now they're, 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 they've got Operation Smile and they've got these dentists. They started it. They just started it. These dentists going from rural village to rural village, giving these people that have already got universal literacy. A lot of them already have, elect most of them already have electricity. And, and now they're, I mean, come on, but, but, you know, but you look at, at Guatemala, you look at Honduras, you look at uh, big parts of Mexico, 
but but socialism fails, right? Right? Socialism's never achieved anything. I mean, unbelievable. The amount of bias in American media is very, very extreme. You know, the Sandinistas, what they've achieved, you know, um, you know, someone says you're you're so angry, man. Well, I you know, I'm angry, but I'm also it's not just that I'm angry. I mean, I, I just am am touched by that. You know, when I was in Ecuador in 2013, when I was at that World Youth Festival, not only did I see, you know, all these socialist groups that I learned from, but what else did I do? I also, I also saw dental care facilities. And I saw that where they had dentists along the side of the street, you know, with the socialist, uh, you know, the Rafael Correa socialist logo and people would get their free dental care. Um, you know, the, the, the government was giving kids free karate, like martial arts training. And every morning in the park where they had this festival, it was like a former airport park that the kids would be out there doing their karate. It was like a martial art that they had learned, uh, from their, their socialist president, Rafael Correa. Um, you know, you know, I, I mean, I walked through a neighborhood in, in Caracas, every single house had been built with an interest free loan provided by the government. Prior to that, people had lived in shacks without running water and electricity. You know, um, wow. I mean, I. but they, they keep saying socialism has never accomplished anything. Socialism's always failed. So they keep hammering this home. I don't understand it. I don't, it, it's like, you know, it's like they're saying that the sky is blue, right? What was China like before 1949? What is it like now? What was Russia like before 1917? What is it like now? Socialism has achieved so much in in terms of bringing, I mean, Egypt, for goodness sakes. I, I've talked about this before. I talk about it in the book. Most uh, huge chunks of Egypt didn't have electricity until the Soviet Union teamed up with the Arab socialist government of Abdel Nasser and built the Aswan Dam. That, that, that huge hydroelectrical fa facility, the biggest hydroelectrical power plant in the Middle East was built by socialism. You know, uh, the Three Gorges Dam in China, the biggest hydroelectrical facility in the world that brings electricity all throughout the Chinese countryside, built by socialism. You know, I, I mean, how do these people who sit there and they're, well, socialism never achieved anything. It just everywhere it's ever been tried. It's just completely failed. They're not speaking the truth. They're not speaking the truth. Um... You know, I, yeah, I, right. Someone says they, they heard a classmate say in 1991, Russia finally had food. Actually, no. In 1991, Russia's agricultural system fell apart. Uh, you know, uh, roughly 80,000 farms. In, in 1991, Russia was forced to start importing all of its food from the United States. Now, Russia, Russia is growing their own food at, at, at big numbers, right? They're having a farming boom in Russia right now, right? Um, the Far East and elsewhere. And, and, where is it coming from? The government. The state-controlled oil company is loaning all these farmers to start their own. I mean, it's like, right? You look at Russia, okay? Russia, right? 1917, revolution, civil war. When does the economy get better? When Stalin does the five-year plans and they suddenly they have a steel industry, they electrify the country, they have a war against the Nazis, they rebuild, you know, they get even stronger. When does their economy go bad? 1991, the collapse where everything falls apart and all of a sudden you have mass unemployment. They have capitalism. Capitalism comes in there. Yeltsin's privatizing things. Jeffrey Sachs is there. Neoliberalism. Capitalism is destroying it. When does it get better? Starts getting better. 1999, Putin's elected and gradually he creates two government-controlled, state-run oil, uh, oil and gas companies, Gazprom and Rosneft. That's how their economy gets better. I don't understand it. How can one look at the history of Russia and say, oh, well, well, socialism never worked, if, but when they had capital, it's like when they had free market capitalism in the 1990s, the country was wrecked. I don't get it. I really don't get it. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I went to Ecuador prior to 2013. I went to Ecuador when I was a 12-year-old kid in 1999. And I got off the plane in Quito with my father. I had never seen that level of poverty. Look at what Latin America was like before the, they call it the pink tide. What was Latin America like before the pink tide? What was Venezuela? What was central Caracas like before the pink tide? What, 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 was, what was Quito, Ecuador? I saw Quito, Ecuador when I was 12 years old in the 1990s before the pink tide. You know, unbelievable. China has built so many power plants in Brazil. I mean, they, they have gone, I mean, it's, it's like 
socialism has, has raised people all over South America out of poverty, right? It has raised 700 million people in China out of poverty. It turned Russia into the first country in outer space, but it's never accomplished anything. Nope, never. How do these people... It's and no one challenges them on it. Not Bernie Sanders, not Andrew Yet. Nobody, you know, they get up there, well, communism killed a hundred gajillion million bajillion people and never did anything good and just made everyone poorer and worse off than they were before. That's not true. That is just not the truth. Some things are true and some things are not. And that is a lie. That's just a lie. And it's so obviously a lie. I mean, it's beyond me. It is beyond me. How, I mean, it's, the, the facts are right there. Sputnik, goodness gracious. How do people say this stuff? It's beyond me. Sorry, I'm getting fired up about it, but I just, I hear it all the time. Whenever this topic of socialism co and communism comes in, everyone knows that communism has never achieved anything. And that's just not the truth. And no one cares. And 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 it affects us. We can't, you know, we can't have food stamps. Well, the Soviet Union, everyone starved to death and was miserable. So you know, that's communist. You know, and they've been doing this. They've been running this game on us for years, right? Oh, you know, we can't have a minimum wage. That's communism. Oh, we can't have free health care. That's communism. And the Soviet that that lie about what happened in the 20th century, the myth of the 20th century, is essential to neoliberalism. No one would, would agree with neoliberalism for half a second if it wasn't for that lie, right? If, if this false, false historical interpretation of the 20th century, right? If, if this false interpretation of, of what went on in the 20th century wasn't so widespread, right? If that, if that, if that false retelling of what I heard in the 20th century wasn't so widespread, you know, we we could we could have a much better we could have more of a welfare state. You could I mean, the reason that it comes up when Bernie Sanders comes out and says, oh, I want to give everyone free health care. What do they say? Well, you can't do that. Look what happened with Stalin. I mean, as long as people continue to believe this lie that that you need capitalism, that without capitalism, there's no economic growth. As long as people continue to believe that, things are not going to get better, right? This lie must be refuted. All of American economics is precedented on this lie. It is precedented on not acknowledging that economic growth ever happened in the Soviet Union. Um, I, I mean, I hate to ramble on, I hate to repeat myself, but I, it, it, it's just something that we have to recognize here, that... that that the, the problem of U.S. society is ideological. People really believe that, that, that if you don't have the free market capitalist system, there's no other way of doing things. And there clearly, clearly is. Um, so, yeah. Um, must be said. Um, so, yeah. I'm going to get off here in a few minutes because it's late. Um, but, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it must be said, I, you know, I mean, someone's saying, you know, Australia has free healthcare. No, I, I'll tell you, right. Mo every other industrial country in the world has, you know, guaranteed healthcare, whether it's national healthcare or, or Medicare for all, you know, but I kid you not, when I was in college, someone I was supposed to respect, and this drives me crazy, right? Someone who was like a, a, an authority position at the college, they told me they had just seen Michael Moore's movie Sicko. I said, okay. And they said, you know, and I, they said they, 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 they didn't like it though. I said, why? And they said, because, you know, I don't think we can have national health care because it's never worked anywhere in the world. And I just thought about that for a second and I was just like, okay. I said, you do realize every other industrial country in the world has it. And they said, no, 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 the Soviet Union... And this was somebody I was supposed to like. This was like a, a person in an, an administrative position. I was like, that was their argument. We can't have free health care because it's never worked anywhere in the world. It's like, well, gee, on Britain, France, Germany, right? I guess they're all starving and miserable and, and desperate, right? Um, right? They're all fleeing. I mean, you know, but that's how, I mean, you know, it's like 
oh, you say socialism? That's the Soviet Union. And they have this myth about what the Soviet Union was like. And that's that. Um, you know, and, 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 it, and it's so well ingrained among the culture. Like Putin comes out and he says that the collapse of the Soviet Union was a tragedy. And in Russia, that is not a controversial statement, right? Anti-communists agree with it. Communists agree with it. All kinds... Of, because people remember what happened. The collapse of the Soviet Union was an economic disaster, right? Mass unemployment, hunger, desperation, drug addiction, suicide. It was, it was an economic disaster for the country. But, but, right? In the U.S. media, they're like, he said the collapse of the Soviet Union was a disaster. What a lunatic. And it's like... It's like this is so ingrained among the population that like they make it out like like Putin saying that the collapse of the Soviet Union was a disaster is like Holocaust denial, right? Putin's not a communist, not a Marxist, but he says the collapse of the Soviet Union was a disaster and they, they're like, aha, we got him. What a crazy thing to say. And it's like, have they looked at any economic statistics from that time? It, it's crazy. I mean, this, this lie has been so ingrained among the population Right? And, and immediately, when you argue with these people, the conversation immediately changes to human rights. You start showing them economic data, and then they go, oh, yeah, yeah, but they violated human rights, so none of that counts. And that's funny. That's funny, because if that's the case, right, every time you herald America's economic achievements, you say, oh, Native American slavery doesn't count. No one does that, right? And, and nobody, right, if they say, oh, the USA has a strong economy, that's because of capitalism. No one sits there and goes, oh, but the USA killed Native Americans and there was slavery and racism, so none of it counts. No. They say, oh, well, our, our capitalist system has had all these achievements. And yeah, slavery and all that was bad, but, but that's separate. Oh, it's separate, right? But, but the second that you say that everyone wasn't poor and starving under Stalin and there were huge economic achievements, they go, oh, yeah, but there were gulags, so whatever. Are you defending gulags? Right? It, it's, it's, like, it's like a confirmation bias that is so unbelievable where it's like, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's like on, on this basis, right? If you say, I mean, if you apply that logic, right? Nothing in the United States, all these people that say capitalism is great because the United States and socialism never worked because of gulags, right? On I, that, that's, it doesn't apply. Like, this is like, you know, human rights violations, atrocities, bad things go on, don't prove that the economy didn't expand, right? The economic numbers, the standard of living increasing, that all happens, you know, I, you know and, and that's the argument, right? You, you'll get from people is you'll show them the concrete data that the Soviet Union produced huge amounts of economic growth, vastly improved living standards, and then they go, oh yeah, but they have gulags, so none of that counts. And like, no, no, that's not how things work. Right. Um, and then the crazy thing is these libertarians love human rights violations. They love it. Right. Uh, uh, check out uh, the, what they say about Pinochet. Right. Look at their helicopter memes. They love they love they love authoritarian dictators because they kill communists. Right. They love it. Right. You know, they tell you, oh, we're all about freedom. No, they're not. No, they're not. They're about freedom to make money. That's what they're about. Right. I mean, I mean, they really are, um, you know, um, but. Enough said, enough said. Um, you know, I, I'm going to get into a more positive mindset. I, I think I'm just tired. It's a summer night. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm tired, but I love you all. I really do. And we're doing something very, very special here. Um, I get frustrated here, but I care about you all. I really do. And we're doing something really special here. We really are. Um, and, uh, you know, it's been a good live here tonight. A lot of you, uh, a lot of super chats. I'm still very deeply grateful for that really big one I received. And, uh, you know, I mean, we're doing great things here. And I am optimistic, right? I know that, you know, we're in the middle of a hard time in the country. We really are. The standard of living is dropping, you know, and all of that. But, you know, there's a generation of young people who are open to hearing about socialism. There's a rising alternative on the global economy. Um, you know, information is widely accessible. Things are changing, right? I have never had a Sunday that was not followed by a Monday. And I've never had a Monday that was not followed by a Tuesday. Never had a Tuesday that was not followed by a Wednesday. A does not equal A, right? That's one of, it boils down to the essential essence of Marxism. A does not equal A. Gotta remind yourself this. It can get hard sometimes. You gotta remind yourself this. 
All right. A, first A, can never equal the second A, right? Can't ever happen. A does not equal A. There is no way that that first A that I drew can be the exact same as the second because the entire world is constantly in motion, right? Nothing is permanent in the universe. All that exists is constant change. That is a, a fundamental reality. And as bad as you think the present is, it's only temporary. That applies to good things too. But it, it must be said that the world is constantly in motion and that things don't stay the same. If you had told me, if you had told me 20 years ago that there'd be a major presidential candidate calling himself a socialist, I would be blown away. I would not believe you. I would not believe you. And that's how these things are. Things, And I've noticed that things are moving at a faster pace. Now that technology and information technology has made things, you know, so widely available, you know, you know, ideas are shifting much more rapidly than they used to. Um, and that's having a big impact. You can't underestimate that. And, um, you know, we're headed for some, some big, big changes, right? Um, uh, you know, and I, I think it must be said. Um, so, you know, I really appreciate you all. I really do. Um, it's late. I'm having a great time doing this late night live. Um, and, uh, you know, hey, um, you know, I must say, you know, there's a lot of things in this world that are, that are not right. But there, there is a drive within us human beings. We are creative creatures. We struggle to make a better place. We struggle to make a better world. We want the world to be better than it is. We want a better life for our kids. We want a better life for our community. We have the city building tendency within us. We are creative creatures. And, and we are struggling. And, and we have the ability to make tomorrow better than today. No species has ever done what we've done. We have gone from hunter-gatherers and caves in the woods to space travel and iPhones. No species has ever done that, ever. We have the ability with our creativity and our brilliance to do amazing things as human beings. But the struggle is, will we be able to harness it effectively to keep marching forward? Progress. If you think about the time in your life that you've been most happy, it's the time when you've been most progressive. When you're moving ahead, when life is getting better for you, right? When life is getting better for your family, when you're achieving goals, that's when you're happy. And people that aren't happy, people that are depressed, they generally are people that don't have the feeling that tomorrow is going to be better than today. They, 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 they feel like things are not improving. They feel like, you know, like there's no hope. There's no reason to wake up in the morning. That's what the depressed are. Progress, historical progress, human progress is essential, is essential for people. Right? If you want if you if you want to be a human being, if you want to not be an animal, right? If you want to embrace the rational side of humanity, you have to embrace progress. Progress is the definition of what defines us as humans. You know, Frederick Engels very famously said, he says, while uh, while other species only interact with the environment, humans have the ability to make the environment serve them. So there you go. You know, we are, we are on a precipice. History is marching forward very rapidly, right? I'm optimistic. The world is changing. So I'm glad you've all been with me here tonight. It's been fun. It's been fun. I wish you all the best. It's been a ride, as Proletarian Storm is saying. I'm having fun, though. We're all having fun. We talked about UFO, communism, Posadism. We talked about all kinds of stuff. It's been fun. Have a good night.